please welcome back your host, Tony Militello. Well, welcome back again. Uh, good morning. And, and to some of you, we've transitioned into the afternoon. And so good afternoon. And, and we appreciate you taking the time to uh, to come back and join us for the next two exciting panel discussions. We've got, uh, again, two great panels lined up ahead of us. Uh, you know, Dr. Van's presentation this morning, yesterday, we really heard about many things that were people centric uh, and things that were really talking about the individuals and, and kind of their personal experiences. Dr. Van did exactly that. And he was a really a good pivot point this morning. It's really what we heard you know, initially in many of the questions that were posed, we're talking about the individual, you know, and how do we, how do we deal with the actual individual's experiences, whether it be their symptoms, their treatments, uh, their, their, you know, their physical health. And, you know, then he, right towards the end of his presentation, he, he made a transition to talking about the culture of support and talking about organizational things, whether that be uh, again, the support that an organization provides, the, the feedback that the supervisors and an organization provides to the employee, the reasonable accommodations that, it, that an employer might make. And so the next two presentations and, you know, panel, not presentations, but panel discussions, they're really going to look at very much uh, the same thing kind of from an organizational standpoint, talking about uh, resiliency and crisis management from an organization standpoint, right, how the organization can develop a sense of resiliency uh, w among themselves as an organization and their, their employees and how they can get ready in a crisis management uh, position. And then the last panel that we'll hear uh, is really talking about the workforce and hybrid workforce. But again, much of that's going to be around uh, the organization's presentation of their response to that, uh, those types of scenarios and those types of um, uh, individual items associated with, it, with their employees. So, you know, the things that we're hearing here are, you know, successful learnings from one crisis means that means little when we are not systemically implemented in order to mitigate future ones. Yet, as the country moves on from COVID, uh, we, have we truly prepared for our next black swan event? In this next session, you'll hear from resiliency and business continuity experts on how to best address these issues, sustainability for the, sustainability for the future. You also learn about resources like Health Action Alliance's Pandemic Preparedness Playbook that you saw a little bit about yesterday and how that can best prepare your organization for, the future, for whatever the future holds. It's my pleasure now to introduce the panelists. First, we have Stephen Massey. Stephen is a social entrepreneur and communications expert who builds unlikely partnerships for social good across geographies, industries, and sector. Over the past 15 years, he has led integrated cause marketing campaigns in the U.S. and abroad and has cultivated initiatives with major foundations, media organizations, international institutions, and Fortune 500 companies. Stephen is the co-founder of Meteorite, the social impact firm that powers the Health Action Alliance. Good morning, Stephen. Jeanette Thanks Dini is... Great, thank you. Uh, Jeanette Dini is the Occupational Health Director for Cummins Incorporated a multinational corporation that designs, manufactures, and distributes engines, filtration, and power generation products, headquarters in Columbus, Indiana. Based in Scotland with business management and occupational health and safety degrees and over 40 years of employment experience, starting with the education sector, Janetta moved into Cummins 15 years ago. In her role, Janetta has the opportunity to continue to share her passion and drive for the health, safety, and well-being of employees and their families through interaction with multiple stakeholders within and outside of Cummins. Janetta, good day. Thank you. And finally, we have Joyce with Witham. Uh, Joyce is the risk manager with over 20 years of operations work with Liberty Mutual in risk, safety, and business continuity. She specializes in working with business operations to develop innovative and streamlined approaches to continuity and crisis response. Joyce, good morning to you. Good morning. Great. Well, again, we've got a uh, an, about an hour or so ahead of us. We've got uh, six or seven questions prepared that we have gone through and, and uh, to help facilitate this panel discussion. But again, I invite the audience who was very active during the most recent presentation to continue to be equally as active and engaged uh, by posing your questions or questions of interest that you have putting those in the chat function. And again, we will get to those, whether that whether or not we get those to, at the very end or intermix those with the questions that we currently have. Uh, we will look forward to, again,
your participants, what's going to bring the greatest value to you as attendees is to make sure that you have your questions answered. But with that, I'm going to you know, kick it off and, and warm up this conversation here with the first question that we have. Uh, and Janetta, this question is for you. Again, certainly with all the other questions, uh, going to be posed to an, an individual initially, but then uh, the other two panelists certainly have an opportunity uh, to inject. And again, hopefully this will be much more of a conversation uh, than just kind of a rote uh, question and answer period. But you know, again, this first question is for you. How have you experienced uh, the pandemic and how has it shaped the way we look and talk about safety? Do you think that your organization's safety performance improved, declined, stayed the same or something else? So thanks for that question. Um, and I'd like to kick off, first of all, by talking about the, the performance and consider particular points in time um, through the, the two years plus of the pandemic that we've all experienced. So we all know pandemic, if we're looking at late 2019, um, our site closures um, in locations globally really occurred um, round about March 2020. Um, that meant we only had business critical staff on site at those points in time. Our protocols were put in place um, from then through to May 20. And by that, I'm talking about things like um, screening, social distancing, additional cleaning, etc. cetera. Um, latterly, then we had phased returns to office looking at March 22 and then April 22, a full reopening of our office facilities. So it, it ties in with one of those timelines, the March 20 site closures, that we had obviously a significant drop in hours and a significant drop in incidents. That led to a steady decrease in our incident rate taking that to a low of 0 0.7 in January 21. Now that had dropped from 0 0.6 in January um, 20. So we, we looked at a significant drop there when we had closures of plants and then that slow reopening bringing manufacturing individuals in first. But bearing in mind, in, depending where we were in the world, we had the opportunity to cut back on workforce, um, being supported by government initiatives such as furlough in the UK. And we also had loss of headcount through individuals unfortunately becoming unwell. So we, we would look then kind of moving forward, the, the hours and the incident rates both increased gradually from January 21, um, when we were looking potentially at our shop floor workforce, we're, we're mainly back um, to, to full strength. Um, we kind of plateaued out in quarter three um, of 21, moving that plateau into the start of 2022, but we still, stood, still did remain under that 0.6 incident rate. So since those easing of restrictions um, in April 22, the, the incident rate is now sitting at 0.65. So again, we've seen a rise in that incident rate and we haven't seen the same rise in hours as we have as incident rate. So I'm gonna leave that um, brief fluctuation we, we did drop down and then picked back up again um, to worse than we were when the pandemic started. So how do we shape and how do we look at, at safety? How do we talk about it? Um, how has the pandemic affected that? So different ways of working. Um, immediately, like many of you, office workers were then made home workers. Um, I mentioned earlier, we only had business critical individuals on site. So working that through, um, we now sit in a situation where we have 
remote workers, we have hybrid workers, and we have on-site workers. So that's been a, a big learning curve um, through the, the pandemic. Um, that situation now allows us to accommodate the shift back um, to post-COVID, um, pre-COVID, or the normal situation as we knew it historically. Um, it allows individuals who were working at home potentially either to remain as remote workers or become hybrid workers and therefore not upsetting their routines again, their concerns about how they manage their families, etc. What I would say on site especially, um, but not discluding home workers, is the scope of safety has broadened. We are now not only considering physical safety, but mental health safety is really, really prominent and has been since the, the start of the, the pandemic. Um, some areas such as the UK, um, their government and um, the HSE have driven that activity probably further than some of the other locations globally. And we were able to replicate some of the work we were doing in the, the UK. Um, worldwide. So we needed to consider things like burnout on those safety st on those staff that, that were in our locations, concerns about job security, um, which were, were rife, isolation of those that were um, sitting at home working, and lack of interaction and lack of supervision um, with people that they're used to, to dealing with on a daily basis. So we developed very early um, what we call our It's OK campaign, mental health campaign. Um, that continues to run on a monthly basis. We did specific packages for especially the HSE staff who were particularly stressed because a lot of the additional COVID work fell on their shoulders on top of their normal day-to-day -day activities. We did have far more interdepartmental um, engagement. Areas such as travel, HSE, our medical facilities, legal, our risk insurance and our HR functions all fed into a playbook that we developed to guide our sites through the pandemic and the expectations. We've now minimised that to a, a risk profile document, bearing in mind that as a global company, we're not all sitting at the same place. We're not all coming back at the same time, and we're not all removing restrictions at the same time. One of the big learnings was that we always had for many years, a business continuity plan. And we also had a separate pandemic plan. Where the gap was, they didn't really talk to one another. And there were individuals were using them in isolation. Um, I was probably at the outset of bringing those together um, because I was working with China at the, the start of the pandemic. So we then started integrating and using the both the, the continuity plan information linked with the, the medical pandemic plan to feed into our profile and our playbook. Um, raising understanding of the impact of what we were expecting as a business, the demands of the business on the employee, and the retention of the employees was something else that we looked at a bit more deeply um, on the back of the additional stresses that our employees were under. So I've spoken a lot and I'll be quiet and let my panel <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> yeah, great. Thanks, Janetta. I certainly appreciate that. Uh, again, in-depth and thorough response. Again, all these questions are going to have uh, a long response again to really to get the sense of how your company responded. Uh, Stephen and Joyce, anything else that you saw, whether it be in your own company or the companies that, you know, and clients that you support uh, with regards to the performance as a result of uh, the pandemic? 
Joyce, maybe start with you if you have anything to add. Sure. I I think I I just wanted to echo some of what Janetta shared with the fact that you had a pandemic plan and then you had a continuity plan and looking during this event, actually bringing them together and really looking at things a little bit more holistically became very important. And also um, echoing that kind of new challenges of people working from home. And while we always had people working from home, I think this just really ramped up the fact that, you know, it's not just about safety when they're there in the office. It's how do we ensure that safety at home as well? And um, we looked a lot at how can we empower people to own their safety and provide them with tools and resources that they can use and apply that at home. Um, and I think one of the other things that, um, again, just echoing, I was nodding along with Janetta when she was saying this was just the amount of engagement across the organization from all these other teams, from our our. HR and talent organization, our communications team, all our legal teams, our operations, all these different folks really coming together to help solve this, um, I think was a really powerful experience. And I think that going forward on other big safety issues or initiatives, it's really nice because we've got that working relationship now with those groups. Um, on a much deeper level than maybe before. So it's it's gonna make it a lot easier on other things that we need to address. Yeah, great, thanks, Joyce. Yeah, I mean, I found the exact same thing is, you know, the pandemic brought people together in a way that, you know, you met colleagues you, you may have never met before. Uh, and certainly, right, to it, health and safety became certainly prominent and, and really at the forefront and, and certainly more relevant. Stephen, I'm sorry I cut you off, but you have something that you wanted to add? No, I think I just echo also what, what I just heard is that it really, the pandemic really created opportunity for health and safety professionals to be in the room with the CEO making critical, mission critical decisions. And one of the things that we know was really critical and important during the pandemic was the trust that uh, safety and health teams uh, were able to build both within the organization and with uh, outside the organization, with public health departments, with other employers, I was really proud that some of the companies that we worked with um, reached out to other employers in their geography to offer support uh, and coaching and training uh, to smaller employers that might not have an EHS team or a chief medical or chief safety officer. So having those relationships and investing in those relationships was really important during the pandemic. And I would argue it's gonna be important going forward. Building those relationships takes time. Building trust takes time. and We've all learned so much over the past three years. I encourage all of us to kind of lean in and continue to nurture and build those relationships going forward. Great, thanks, Stephen. Again, you know, and I think that Safer and the National Safety Council and you know all of our other partners, CDC, NIOSH, and again all the other members uh, that are kind of the behemoth organizations, we did exactly what you mentioned, which is you know we lean forward to help out you know the preponderance of the national safety council's membership which are those small and, and medium-sized businesses that may or may not have a contingency plan or or a pandemic plan again and, and you know, i think is evidenced by the 200 plus participants here today and those that have benefited from previous webinars and other types of products that the, the safer initiative has put forward it's exactly that you know and we are you know we're happy to be able to do that and, and provide that those types of resources uh, Joyce, on to you for the next question. You know, we you gave a little bit of a sneak preview to, to this question in your last response, but can you talk about uh, how does your company define resiliency specifically? Um, and then what did you do to help with worker safety? Again, you gave a little bit of a preview to the worker safety piece, but how would you define resiliency and what may be some things that you gave to your uh, employees to help them be more resilient? Yeah, so um, great question. So. Um, I think when we think about resiliency for our organization, we're really uh, talking about, you know, what's at the root cause of some of these different threats and risks that are out there and how can we strengthen our capacities and um, resources within a system in order to cope with that, um, with the stresses and shocks and other things that can happen that, that we're not expecting. And, um, you know, within the organization, our, our most important resource is our people. And really, I mean, we don't make widgets. It's, it's truly what 
what our people are actually doing. And um, so when we're thinking about resiliency, our, our main focus is really thinking about our people and how do we work best together to cope with those risks and stresses and shocks. Um, and we typically will approach it making sure that we're very knowledgeable about the risk, you know, what, what's out there. Um, making sure too that we understand how that could impact our organization and that we truly understand our organization. And then um, by doing that, that's gonna help us be able to take decisive actions, make fast decisions, and then we can adapt and modify as we go forward. So, um, you know, if that's, that's our basic approach to it, but when you think about um, during COVID, um, how all of this began to roll out um, or at the end of 2019, early 2020, um, we started down a path as soon as we started hearing that rumblings about it, um, because we have operations globally, we set out to learn everything we could about this virus. Um, so that we can make the right decisions from a safety perspective for our people. And one of the first steps we did was actually we retained an outside expert in infectious disease who guided us throughout the pandemic on the latest in developing information about it globally. Um, so whether we had operations in the US, US or if it was Brazil or China or um, different parts of Europe or other parts of the world, we really had an understand about understanding of what was happening in terms of emerging knowledge about it, how it was spread, how the disease progressed, and some of the early understandings too of variants as they began to emerge. Like what were their unique features? Were they more infectious? Were they less infectious? Was there a high or low uh, virulence associated with a particular variant? And where were those, those variants um, predominant? Um, we also sought to working with experts, working with outside the organization, everything we could learn about the safety protocols necessary and whether or not those would change or evolve with the different variants. Um, because we were really wanted to understand it in terms of how do we reduce the likelihood of transmission between our employees, um, if they're working together, if they needed to be together, and even more importantly, too, between our employees and our customers. Um, and so those questions became very important. Also, when we thought about virulence of this, we also wanted to learn as much as we could about the vaccines, the therapeutics, so that we had a whole picture, not just are people going to get sick, but how sick, how, how bad could it be? Um, because that helps to inform us and think about it from a risk standpoint. Um, and based on that too, we set up processes to track the disease um, by country and also within the U.S. by state so that we could ultimately um, ensure that we're making the right decisions for our operations. And then um, finally, we sought to understand how other external pressures and responses to the virus would affect our people and our operations. So this included tracking and monitoring the regulatory environment in which our people were operating in. Um, were there areas that they had to wear masks or not masks? Were, did they have to be vaccinated or not vaccinated? You know, what was really being required so that we could help um, help them be informed as well. And we needed to understand this both domestically and abroad. And um, finally, we knew that we had to have um, a broad and consistent understanding of this risk across all parts of the organization, um, anywhere where decisions were being made. So it wasn't just we're gathering this information, um, it's we also became responsible for making sure that this information is communicated across the organization so that we're all kind of operating and making decisions from the same playbook. Um, to do this, we set up a regular cadence of meetings up and down and across the organization to keep um, high level executives aware of what was going on um, in terms of risk in all these different areas. Um, to keep management and operations folks out on the front line 
informed, as well as all of those various supporting groups, whether it's legal and talent and communications, all of them came together um, for these regular cadence of meetings. Um, and as we as we work through this, we always tried to ensure that we were always keeping our people first and uh, first and being open and transparent throughout the process. Um, with that too, our next main um, tenant is to make sure we know the organization and how it's impacted by this risk. So um, I think too, the pandemic really changed the way that we work through a crisis event. And I think primarily because it was everywhere. Um, typically from a crisis management standpoint, when we work through events, it would be we'll work through a location or a region or maybe even a country, but this was everywhere. So we had to think about um, how do we communicate and how do we work through this as an organization as a whole? So we needed to have that holistic approach, but yet um, we had to get very granular in the way that it would affect our operations. Um, for example, we needed to dig in a little bit deeper to understand, um, for example, how, how long could these particular <laughs> operations work virtually? Was it indefinite as long as needed? Or at some point, did they really have a business critical need to be back in the office to be working together? Um, likewise, with customer interactions, how who could do the work virtually? When does it have to be done in person? Um, and who and when do people need to be together in large groups versus small groups? And as you can imagine, with an organization of 50,000 people, it wasn't always easy to get all of these answers. And so that's really where we had um, the safety team, the business continuity team, and then folks within the operations really come together to dig in, understand this, and almost do like, um, a job safety analysis, but with that COVID lens on it to really look and pull out what are those safety protocols that are going to be unique for that type of work that's being done. Um, and then as we're doing that, and as we're working through that, it's not just how, how are we keeping people safe? What are we doing? But also, what do people think and believe? What, how are they feeling about this? Um, because that's also going to inform the things that we need to do. Um, so we worked with our employee experience group to also help us get pulse checks from our employee population to find out what they were doing about those communications and protocols. Um, with all of this information, we were then able to pull it together for our leadership so that they could make decisions um, the various aspects of our organization and operations groups could um, quickly implement some of the things that we were putting in place that we were recommending. And then over time, um, we used, um, we set up a system to show risk by country, by state. We had um, safety protocols based on the various jobs, based on those different risk categories. Um, and all of that, we made it available for employees, for managers, for leaders, so that they could get into there um, and help to truly understand what was needed to manage, manage their work and do it safely. Um, so at the end of the day, I think the biggest piece was sticking to some of those core values um, in putting our people first, um, keeping it simple, being open and transparent about where the risk was and what people could do about it, and um, making sure that people also understand how we came about that information to keep people safe. Great, thanks, Joyce. Appreciate it, uh, Stephen. I saw your head nodding uh, north and south direction for a couple of those comments that uh, Joyce was making. Anything that really resonated and, and stood out to you before we get to the next question with you? Yeah, I mean, I really so appreciate um, the way that Joyce framed that up because it really speaks to the central role that business played during the pandemic as part of our public health infrastructure. 
I think employers and many for the first time really stepped into that role, you know, delivering public health information to employees. I think Joyce described them hiring an outside infectious disease expert to counsel uh, the company in what it was communicating to employees. So I think employers really understood the trust that they've earned with their employees and employers really worked hard to make sure that they were able to get that messaging right. You know, the Edelman Trust Barometer and other surveys signal that Americans trust their employer more than just about any other institution. In fact, during the pandemic, em Americans trusted their employer second only to physicians for information on COVID uh, and vaccines. And so employers were thrust into that role and they took that role very seriously uh, and responsibly. Uh, I also think that the, Joyce described that you know her organization embraced a role that it may not have played before, and that is not just delivering public health content, but taking actions to ensure and strengthen the public health of their people. Um, and that includes you know hosting town halls and virtual events with public health officials and leaders, working with employee resource groups, listening to employees to understand their needs, and then when vaccines became available employers across the country really leaned in to accelerate the vaccine response. They did things like host on-site testing events and uh, on-site vaccinations for workers and their families. They offered incentives to get vaccinated. They provided paid time off for workers to get their shots and recover. Uh, some companies offered paid time off to working parents to get, vaccinated, get their kids vaccinated. So there were a lot of actions that employers took for the very first time, and I think one of the things that we're encouraging employers to take is not to revert back to some pre-pandemic normal where these types of things weren't taking place in your workplace. Uh, instead, what we're encouraging folks to do is to lean in and make this the new normal, continue to invest in public health communications and brokering those relationships with local officials and in providing the kind of health support that your employees um, have now come to appreciate and come to expect. Yeah, great. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, your uh, colleague and friend, uh, Malcolm Glenn, yesterday mentioned much of what you just mentioned. Uh, you know, 77% is what he quoted, and very similar to, I'm sure, the statistics from the same source. 77% of the employees trusted their employer with the health information. Uh, and, you know, and, and that's one of the things I know that the Safer Task Force, you know, from the inception, uh, the, all, everything that we had, you know, publicized was exactly to that point was, you know, use that as your resource. But very much to your your closing comment there, uh, you know we have developed a culture of care and a culture of support that has been unprecedented in the workplaces. Uh, you know those employees would certainly be shocked and, and really dismayed, I suspect, uh, if companies were to roll back those uh, levels of support that they have you know have become accustomed to. Not, not only become accustomed to, but again, I think is enhance the productivity, enhance the sense of community that employees are finding now with their employer. Uh, so I'm going to again. Uh, Go to you, Stephen, with the next question. Uh, so the Health Action Alliance obviously has issued a comprehensive new playbook to help companies prepare for future pandemics. What are some of the key recommendations that the playbook is, meant, is, is making? Yeah, well, first, Tony, I wanna to say thank you to, have, to you and to NSC for um, inviting me to be here today um, and for being such an important partner and investor in the Health Action Alliance. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Health Action Alliance, we are a joint initiative of NSC, um, along with the Ad Council and the CDC Foundation uh, and the De Beaumont and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And what we do is we offer free tools, events, and resources to more than 5,000 employers across the country on issues uh, that can help them make their workplaces and communities healthier and safer. So, you know, for us, the COVID-19 pandemic, as I said a moment ago, really taught us that the health of a business and its people extends well beyond the walls of a workplace. Uh, you know, we, we, we've heard already today that during a public health emergency, poor community health conditions can make people more vulnerable to serious illness and death, and that has devastating impacts on business. So we argue that businesses would be well served not to just invest in their own teams and their own workplaces, but also in the communities where they operate. And, you know, that really is the key takeaway of our new pandemic preparedness plan for business, which you can now find uh, via a link that's being dropped into the chat. Uh, this playbook was informed by more than 30 leaders from the business community and public health departments across the country. And first person audio transcripts with more than 50 CEOs 
uh, that were interviewed during the pandemic, and also more than a year of our own learnings at the Health Action Alliance. And the plan provides a blueprint to help your company uh, capture your learnings from COVID-19 and strengthen your relationships with public health and continue to build trust with your employees, which we think all of those things are really mission critical to improving both your workplace and community health in ways that's gonna allow your organization to better weather the next crisis. Uh, at its core, our plan uh, makes the case that every company is now in the healthcare business. Uh, the pandemic really underscored the indispensable role that employers play as part of our public health infrastructure and doing the kinds of things that I just described, delivering health information, helping workers and their families get tested and vaccinated, um, and improving access to care and much more. So you know, even as COVID recedes, we think employers will be well served to not re revert back, but to lean in, to continue to strengthen their readiness for whatever uh, future emergency comes next. So we think com strengthening community sh health should be uh, at the highest goal, uh, but there are steps or what we call four level levels on a pandemic preparedness ladder that we are encouraging companies to take. Uh, that first step really is to shore up and protect employee health in the workplace. Uh, and this includes things like improving indoor air quality to limit the spread of airborne pathogens, making it easier for employees to receive immunizations at work, including for routine immunizations, um, offering preventive care screenings at work, and providing paid sick leave. You know, one in five working American adults today does not have access to paid sick leave, but we know that allowing employees to stay home when they're not feeling well helps keep infectious diseases from spreading among your workers. Um, we've also heard, I think, uh, earlier this morning from Janetta that mental health support was really critical um, at Cummins, and this is something that we're hearing across every organization around the country. So uh, protecting employee health means protecting both physical and mental health. At the second level of our pandemic re preparedness ladder uh, is that we are encouraging companies to develop ready-to-use emergency response plans and engage in some of that scenario planning that we heard uh, Joyce talk about. You know, companies that had those types of cross-functional teams in place and strategies at hand to uh, respond to an epidemic or an emergency, those companies were much better positioned to pivot quickly back in March 2020 when the pandemic emerged. So companies should act now to review their pandemic response plans and collect their learnings from COVID-19. And they should continue with their tabletop scenario planning um, and live exercises. You know, Disney is a company in our network, and they told us that how the scenario planning that they engaged in around Zika uh, several years ago really helped them get a jump start on responding to COVID-19. Um, it's also important to note that many employers told us that this crisis planning can take many forms, and the types of planning that is needed for emergencies like natural disasters aren't the same as preparing for a pandemic. So if you have multiple response teams, make sure those teams are coordinated integrated and are planning for a variety of potential challenges. At our third level of our pandemic preparedness ladder of engagement, we encourage companies to continue building or deepening relationships with local public health officials and employers. We know uh, going forward that misinformation is going to be an even greater challenge that all of us are going to have to face. And every future public health emergency, especially in our lifetimes, is going to be compared against COVID-19. And so right now, employers have earned a lot of trust from their employees. Uh, it's important for employers to continue building that trust over time and extend that trust to local public health official, officials who do not enjoy the same level of trust uh, within communities. Companies have asked what that might look like. Well, it could mean organizing regular town halls with an epidemi epidemiologist or a public health leader to answer questions about new threats like monkeypox or piggyback on, on topics like RSV. Um, it certainly would include making routine immunizations available in the workplace. Um, and there could be more intentional opportunities to tie your company's CSR or ESG investments around local public health challenges. Um, I'd also encourage companies to continue working with and investing in employee resource groups and affinity groups and providing those groups with access to public health leaders and training to be able to communicate about public health within their organizations. You know, when your local public official health officials are recognized around the workplace, 
then they're not the faceless bureaucrats. And that type of familiarity can breed trust, especially in times of an emergency when misinformation may take root. So what we're saying here really is that companies should continue this steady drumbeat of trusted communications that establish good health habits, that demystify public health and neutralize the kind of resistance to public health measures in the workplace like masking that may be required in an emergency. And then finally, at the top of our pandemic preparedness ladder, we encourage companies to actually invest in community health solutions in partnership with public health departments. You know, as I mentioned at the top, companies can no longer afford to ignore the reality that community health conditions make a really big difference on the health of their employees. And community health conditions are the driver, really, of employee health. You know, your zip code matters more than your genetic code um, in times of emergency and, frankly, all the time. What we know is that despite that reality, most companies are investing the bulk majority of their healthcare spending in individual employee health and not shoring up the community conditions in which their employees live and play and pray. And so what we think is really critical and what we've heard from companies in our network is that fostering public-private collaboration to improve community health condition and address those social determinants of health is really challenging, uh, but also really important. And our playbook provides a practical guide to help companies develop those relationships with public health departments and make the kinds of investments that are gonna improve not just worker health, but the health of the communities uh, in which they operate. So our pandemic readiness plan, again, the link is in the chat, provides really detailed descriptions about how to move up that ladder of engagement. Um, and we offer pro tips from companies around the country that have delivered on some of these very recommendations and help informed uh, how we're encouraging companies to take action. Great, thanks, Stephen. Again, uh, everything you mentioned certainly resonates certainly with me and hopefully the other panelists as well. And again, hopefully our audience uh, just as much and uh, a very solid tie back to some of the things that I mentioned. Uh, again, your colleague, Malcolm Glenn yesterday presented, you know, two things that resonate that you clearly reiterated, which, which are exactly important. Uh, one, the truth sandwich, right? The truth sandwich is always on the menu, right? Presenting that truth because we have become a trusted advisor. We as employers have become the trusted advisors for our employees. Uh, and so to continue to tr you know, trust in our employees and serve up that truth to them uh, couldn't be more important. Again, that's something, certainly something that should be always, again, always on the menu. Uh, again, and then uh, also, as you mentioned, right, leaning outside these four walls uh, becomes equally as important. So that it's not just worrying about our employees within the workplace uh, and uh, during their work time, but it's also extending it beyond the workplace and again, in, in extending it beyond the work time. So again, appreciate you uh, providing that information. And again, as, as Stephen mentioned, that information is in the chat. Uh, so again, please take a look at that uh, link that you should see in the chat there. Uh, Danetta, the next question is on to you. Uh, certainly you have seen, you, you've talked about, again, being a global company and certainly some of the things that you've seen outside the, the United States. You know, this question has, is a little bit US centric, but certainly, uh, value your perspective again as a as a leader for a global company. And so the question is this: you know, what are your, some of your big concerns in regards to workplace safety now that most of the United States, at least, has stopped masking or wearing face coverings, social distancing, and many individuals really have uh, executed their return to work policies? What are some of the big concerns that you have? Uh, with that here in the U.S., and is there anything that you, you've come to learn from or, or experience outside the U.S. That, that may be able to be applied here in the U.S.? And thanks for that question, and I think some of what's already been said, um, turning it on its head if those things are missing and don't continue are real big concerns. So to me, um, you've already mentioned not everybody is going back at the same time, we're not removing restrictions at the same time. Um, so as a global organisation, ensuring that we are identifying where we still need to have controls in place, additional support, etc., that has been identified through the, the crisis and being flexible enough and agile enough to switch that on and off as it's required. 
Um, th there's got to be sensible guidelines about switching it on and off. Um, and as Joyce mentioned, we did similar you know, risk analysis processes throughout the, the globe um, involving local medics, um, our own Cummins medics throughout the globe. Um, and having set out that risk matrix that says, if X, Y, and Z conditions are being exhibited, here's the expectation that you would be following in your, your plants or your, your areas. So I think that's really important that we learn coming out of, of COVID that not all regions are the same. And there's going to be different legislations, there are different cultures, and irrespective of what the issue is, those different legislations and cultures need to be taken into account with the solutions that you're delivering to them. So two, two real main areas of concern, individuals and in business. Um, do you know, when we, we talk about individuals, and I'm not going to apologise for mentioning their mental health again. Um, and it's it's that readjusting of coming back into the workplace. I know from personal experience, we had employees through COVID who were knocking at the door to get back in and saying, oh, this isolation is affecting my mental health. I need to be speaking to people. I need to be around people. So in that situation, we would work with the appropriate occupational health people locally and look and see how we could accommodate and relieve any of those issues that that individual had and how could we engage them with others when they're feeling so isolated. Wearing of masks, not everybody was comfortable wearing masks. However, we've got the situation when we're coming back into the workforce that we've got individuals that still want to wear masks and they feel uncomfortable, threatened, insecure, coming back into an environment that the, the protocols, the protections are really now disappearing. So ensuring that the, the message out there, that the communication out there is feeding to those individuals. If they're uncomfortable without a mask, they wear a mask. And we need to ensure that those round about them that are comfortable not wearing masks, are comfortable not social distancing, understand how others feel and that they may behave and react differently to, to them as individuals. Travel, returning to travel. You know, again, we've got individuals who would have done a lot of traveling. Um, prior to COVID, um, in a situation then that maybe they, they've got a new comfort zone that they're, they're not travelling. And now there's that discussion with the, the manager that travel's opened again. Um, how is that managed? And from a, a comfort point of view, again, within our organisation, we've got a, a tiered approval. Um, an individual does not have to travel if they don't feel comfortable. Um, we will ensure that there's somebody else that is comfortable and can pick up that work, whether it's going to a customer, a supplier, or whether it's internal meetings, if it can't be done virtually. Um, so there are processes in place, but I think the, the trust piece that's been mentioned numerous times here is really, really important that we create a safe environment, a safe environment that our individuals feel comfortable in raising their concerns. We continue with that. I think we did it much more readily during COVID than we've done it before COVID, but it's now ensuring that that culture shift remains within the organisation, that people are not hesitant to raise their concerns or to raise issues that they are not comfortable with. Um, one of the, the benefits that I felt that we used during COVID 
was working very closely with our union reps in areas that were unionised. Um, that gave a really a different level of trust. We ensured that the messages that were given, um, whether it be about why we're wearing masks, why we're social distancing, um, and yet why we are offering vaccinations for you and our plants. So those messages were supported, delivered and driven by not only our chief medical officer, but those leaders in the organisation in the C-suite. So the, the groundwork was done in the, the various organisations that we've spoken about before, fed into that hierarchy, and the, the message that came out, or the multiple messages that came out, came out from the, the senior leaders, but were supported by the medical data and the, the agreement and the, the support from the unions made that much, much easier. When we, we look at the, the kind of business side of it or where the, the business is really important, ensuring that our managers, our supervisors understand or continue to spend the time with their employees that they've spent during COVID. We know that we put a push on interactions between managers and supervisors. We expected them to have more regular conversations and one-to-ones, not only with in a one-to-one -one situation, but with their teams, and not always about work. But we had things like group quizzes, etc., that that brought people together remotely, and the expectation or the wish that that interaction continues to the same level is is something that I will I'm concerned about. Um, will the the demands of the business overtake those soft skill requirements and let some of that slip back? One of the other important things I think that the business had to look at, and I think it's valuable, whether it's another crisis or an, a, an individual basis, is the reintegration of our workers back into the workplace. How did we do that? We didn't just open the door and welcome them back in with open arms and, and throw them out onto the, the shop floor or into their office. You know, we needed to think about, can they be phased in? Do they need to be phased in? And this is where some of the, the, the deeper dives and the requirements for managers to understand their individuals and what their capabilities are and what their frame of, of mind is. Some of these individuals coming back into the, the shop floor or the manufacturing environment may well be deconditioned. So we, we thought about putting deconditioning programmes back in place, stretching programmes in place, getting our individuals fit for the physical aspects of their work when they returned fully to that work. Did they need training reminders? We had individuals that worked with us for many, many years, but a refresher of the training requirements, the safety requirements was really important. And the hope that the focus on those areas will continue when we've got individuals returning from ill health or times away from, from work, whether it's a group of individuals or a single individual. The supply chain demands, um, both from a, a shortage of components and then our customer demands and how we meet those demands. And really what that puts us in a situation of is that we've got individuals who are working long hours, sometimes working excessive hours, we are reviewing our incident de details or data um, 
and looking at the hours that have been worked leading up to accidents or incidents. And we're seeing in some of our, our areas, our field engineers, etc., that prior to incidents, their hours of overtime have doubled in the past 12 months. So it's how does the business look after our individuals and deliver what the customer expectations are? It isn't appropriate and it isn't acceptable to overwork the individuals. There, there comes a limit where fatigue is then a, a main contributor to accidents and incidents. And we, we know then performance, irrespective of the job, will deteriorate if people are, are tired. And the, the cross-functional partnerships that we've we've spoken about, and we, we know how important they are. It's really unfortunate that it took a global crisis to make that happen. Um, local crisis, I would say, yeah, potentially those cross-functional teams locally may well have worked together, but having those cross-functional departments and teams work together globally is another step, a big step. And it was delivered through COVID. And my fear is that that does not continue to the same level. My wish is it does. And I feel we are responsible, the individuals that have been involved in leading those cross-functional areas have the responsibility to ensure that that good work continues. We can't sit back on our laurels. Um, we need to ensure that that focus and that energy is still there, albeit the threat is not as visible. It's still visible in some locations within the, the globe. Um, and my, my final, you know, fear is, are we really as, as set up as well as we think for the next global crisis? Are we going to take the learnings away and spend the appropriate time to review what we did, what went well, what didn't go so well, benchmark it against others, share our good practices, and share our poorer practices and then be in a, a really solid position and a place of, of comfort. And yes, continue doing the, the tabletop exercises that we historically would have done under our business continuity planning. If we had an issue, power went down in a, a particular plant, but we never did global continuity planning and bringing in issues such as health issues, the pandemic issues. So I think it's, it's ensuring that we broaden those business continuity plans. We make sure those and the separate pandemic plans are linked together and we just keep talking to one another. Great. Thanks, Joyce. Uh, you know, one of the things that you mentioned you were very, at the very end is and it's been mentioned by the other panelists as well, is continuing to keep up the focus on this, that, you know, it's, you know we shouldn't rest on our laurels, that there is continued need to bring these types of uh, topics to light. And that's exactly why, uh, you know, we're, we continue to have this virtual summit and, we continue to, and it, with the expectation that we're going to have the virtual summit again next year for that exact reason. It's not just the, you know, crisis management in the middle of the crisis, but it's, again, we heard things about long haul COVID or other things that are, planning for the future. And so again, what can we learn? What are companies learning from uh, these past experiences over the last two plus years? And again, what can they use to implement uh, you know, solutions for the future? Joyce, gonna turn to you real quick before heading to, to, to Stephen. Any, you know, as an international company, anything that you have seen uh, in terms of the company's response, again, either here in the US uh, or, or internationally, as a result of the reduction in some of the uh, hazard controls such as social distancing or return to work or or uh, uh, or face coverings. Anything that you've seen, Joyce, that you wanted to add? I, I think that 
one of the keys is just to provide empower people and provide them with that flexibility. So um, Janetta mentioned, you know, if people still feel comfortable or still feel like they need to wear a mask, let them wear a mask, encourage that, um, make sure that people feel safe doing what feels safe to them um, when it comes to that, because we know the virus is still out there. We know how, that individuals um, have personal different levels of tolerance for um, for the virus, um, and we want to make sure that we're supporting our people and putting them first. And um, one of the things too that we're also really trying to understand is how do we keep people educated, especially as things ramp down, so that it doesn't just become noise. What is the right amount of information? What's the right frequency of updates on some of this. So that's all, that's been really interesting as well because we don't want to keep having that in the forefront if, if it doesn't need to be. So that when it does become really important again, we can get it out there and people will pay attention to that. Um, and I also really love um, what Janetta said about making sure too that we are continuing that focus on integrating safety and continuity and crisis management and the work with the operations and keeping all of these groups together um, throughout this. And I, I just really feel like, again, that virus is still out there. We do have that need to still work together to understand if things are going to ramp up, if they're not, or maybe it's another type of threat or something that we'll need to work together on in the future. But just maintaining those ties is really important. Great. Thanks, Joyce. And, you know, the one comment that you made uh, really gets back to a comment that uh, Dr. Van made earlier this morning, which was, you know, the face coverings after a year plus of, of face coverings or social distancing or other hazard controls that were behavior-based in the workplace, those became the new normal for those individuals, right? That became a personal experience for that individual. And, you know, so how does an organization, how does a company continue to, you know, create a culture where if those individuals so choose to continue those types of procedures, whether they be required or not, that we have, a, you know, a healthy respect for that person's individual choices so that they can continue to feel uh, you know, a valued teammate and, you know, and, and not be ostracized or not be, you know, uh, looked down upon or, or, you know, or kind of uh, marginalized as a result of that personal choice for theirs. So that, again, that's a, a really deliberate uh, step that a company need to make. Uh, you know, your your other comment is a great segue uh, to Stephen, a, a question that, we, that I have for you. Again, Janetta and that and Joyce followed up with, again, the importance of retaining those ties within an organization. But the question for you, obviously, the Health Actions Alliance is more externally focused. What are things that need to be or should be kept in place externally? What are you know what are connections or bonds that were uh, made during the pandemic that should be continued and you know and further galvanized uh, as we move forward? Uh, Tony, I appreciate that question. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to respond to Janetta first um, before I turn to that question because I think that she said some things that were really critical. Um, for everybody uh, to take away from this conversation. Um, and the first is that preparing for the next pandemic starts right now. Uh, you know, now is the moment to begin taking action. Um, now is the best time to capture the learnings from COVID-19 while they're all still fresh in our minds and while many businesses still have those emergency response teams in place. Uh, now is the best time to cultivate and strengthen relationships between business and public health that were forged during the pandemic. And now is the time to continue to build trust with it, with your employees um, and within your departments uh, before it slips away. So I really want to underscore that and and um, also highlight. Janetta mentioned some fears that she had about kind of reverting back where uh, to a time when safety and health maybe wasn't at the forefront of uh, the kind of minds of leaders in an organization. I think that there's actually a really important emerging trend that all of us should be excited by. Uh, and that is that workers are now expecting employers to take more decisive actions around health. Um, in fact, I'm going to ask my colleague to drop a Mercer, a recent Mercer study into the chat 
Um, this is their annual survey that they call Inside Employees' Minds. And what this survey is telling us is that employees really have come to expect their employers to communicate about health and focus on health and safety needs and invest in mental health support and lead with empathy. And while the pandemic may be receding in some ways, the appetite from employees for that kind of communication and engagement from their employers is not. And in fact, employees are beginning to get frustrated by employers that are kind of shifting away from that focus on health and safety. And that's why more than half of employees right now are saying that they're actively looking for a new job or at risk of leaving their own. You know, the great resignation isn't that employees don't wanna work, it's that they don't wanna work for you. And so what companies are really scrambling to figure out is, how do we create environments that make our workplace attractive for employees? And when you ask employees what they want, they want in companies that are gonna invest in their health and their safety and their mental health. And so I think for all of us, that really creates an opportunity for us to continue to lean in on these issues and encourage executives in our organizations to do the same. It's not just great for the health of our people, it's great for the health of our business if we continue to make those kinds of investments. Now, you asked me a moment ago, Tony, about the kinds of connections that were made during the pandemic that might be helpful in the case of a future emergency. I'm gonna tell a couple quick stories. So we heard from uh, General Motors, for example, a company in our network, that in all the communities where they operate, they reached out to the local community health departments and that kind of engagement really helped them understand what was happening locally and ask for support when it was needed. Um, in fact, it helped GM get vaccinations to their frontline workers in the very early days when vaccinations were pretty hard to come by. Um, those relationships that GM had with local public health departments weren't built overnight. They've been built over many years. And so having those relationships in place in March, 2020 allowed GM to activate those relationships quickly. GM also reached out to other small and medium-sized businesses where they operate and provided essentially a lifeline to uh, those organizations, leveraging GM's chief medical officer as a health advisor to lots of small and medium-sized companies in the network. Um, it's a similar case for Walmart, another company um, within the Health Action Alliance. You know, they have more than 5,000 retail stores around the country and they empower their managers uh, to develop local relationships with public health officials, which has helped the company respond to local disease outbreaks. Um, and it's also true for small businesses. We've heard from small business owners around the country that local health contacts can offer clarity and authenticity that builds trust. Um, I would also encourage large corporations on today's call to uh, think about the companies in your own spheres of influence, your suppliers, the companies that might be located in your geographic area where your headquarters is located, for example, and find ways to align on public health messaging, on vaccine education, on safer workplace protocols. Creating coalitions locally or with uh, like-minded suppliers in your spheres of influence can really help fill gaps and uh, help those companies support their employees in times of emergency. We heard, for example, that one of the companies in our network, uh, Kia of Georgia, they banded together with other larger companies and the local branch of the state health department, and they had a relationship with them and they were able to create a small, uh, identify a small lab that could conduct PCR testing with results in 36 hours instead of the usual three to five days. And that really allowed their organization to become one of the very first sites to offer same day capabilities um, as the local hospital. So, you know, these types of relationships uh, are really critical, mission critical during an emergency, and they need to be cultivated over time. Uh, so I encourage companies that don't have a relationship with the local public health department to make a call uh, and begin developing that relationship now. And if there are public health officials that are on today's call or listening to this session in a webcast recording, um, I'd encourage them to pick up the phone and call the largest or most influential employers uh, in your jurisdiction. Uh, get those relationships built uh, cultivate those relationships uh, over time. They're gonna be really critical uh, during the next emergency. Great, thanks, Stephen. You know, so we, as we get ready to uh, wrap up this panel discussion here, we've got uh, a little bit more than five minutes left. Again, I wanna give everyone 
really an opportunity to add any last thoughts to, again, to, to this panel's discussion as well as to the audience. So, Joyce, I'm going to start with you. Any final comments that you have or recommendations that you have to, to our, again, our audience of, of over 200 participants from small and large businesses alike, again, national, local, international, what might be some parting thoughts that you have to share with them for steps that they can take uh, in preparation for uh, you know, the, the next pandemic or, or how they can best leverage crisis management in, in their daily operations? Yeah, so I would just have to echo what Janetta and Steve said, that now is the time. And it's not just for the next pandemic, but for really for the next crisis. And I also loved what Stephen said about working with those within our sphere of influence. So working with vendor partners, um, working with um, industry networking groups that you have to really build out. And, and again, not just a pandemic response, but what other things are out there that could be out on the um, horizon. And um, one of the things we, it hadn't come up yet, but I did want to bring in is um, also making that connection with folks that have access to analytics, some folks that are data scientists, they can provide really valuable resources during a crisis situation to help quickly sort through and understand information about your own company, about what's happening externally. Um, so I really think that that's like an important consideration as you're building out and planning and thinking about the next type of crisis. So we learned a lot about that from this event, um, really, again, how do we work together? What are the different groups that we have to work with? What's most critical and why? And also understanding where do we need to really dig into a level of granularity as well as when we need to pull back. And um, as we think about those things, again, I think that's where that power of data and analytics really comes to help you understand what different crisis events out there might actually mean for your organization. And then I think one of the other things that we're doing um, a little uh, differently going forward is we're also building out a uh, more detailed and more nuanced understanding of external threats. So if we understand like what's most important to us, where our people are, and, and as Steven said, zip code matters sometimes more than genetic code when it comes to our people, understanding where people are actually working, what are those environments like, um, we can then bump up an understanding of external threats against where our people are, what the work is that we do, um, where our vendors are to really understand the impact to our organization and we can think about and begin planning for that. So um, again, we're looking at you know unrest, terrorism, war, um, geopolitical threats. Um, we all know you just have to turn on the TV, you see natural disasters, extreme weather, infrastructure issues, supply chain disruption, all these different things could result in a crisis to the organization. So the time is now to really think about what those are, um, how they could impact the organization, and then begin thinking about what those levers are that in a crisis situation you might have to um, move um, and how would you inform and walk through those steps of keeping people informed, assessing the risk, so that we can, you can move quickly and adapt to whatever, whatever might get thrown at you. Great, thanks, Joyce. Uh, Janetta, over to you. Uh, any final thoughts or comments you have in terms of what companies and organizations need to focus on as they prepare for the next uh, organizational or kind of business disruption? What, again, whether we call it a crisis or not, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've got. Uh, Two young adults in my, you know, and, and their definition of a crisis doesn't necessarily meet the, or, you know, rise to the level of an organization's level of a, or definition of a crisis. But, you know, when we talk about uh, future planning, what are some things that you would like to leave with our uh, attendees today? I think Joyce covered it exceedingly well there. Um, underpinning the, the notices of ensure you know what risks potentially are out there. How could those risks affect your businesses, irrespective of, of where you are in the world? And keep that 
clarity, that um, open communication throughout all levels of the organisation, and that will retain the trust that's been built. And sharing that source of truth also, to me, keeps that, that trust and understanding of why organisations and businesses are making the decisions that they are and asking individuals to follow particular protocols. If they understand where that information is coming from, um, again, to Joyce's point, sharing where the data is coming from, you know, is it renowned data? It's, it's come from experts. Um, and then that that strength and, and resilience to me will, will remain within the organization. Great, thanks, Janetta. And Stephen, we'll follow up and, and, and finish and close this out uh, with you. Any final comments that you may have uh, that may not have already been touched on in terms of what organizations can do to prepare for the future? Well, first, I just wanna acknowledge everyone on today's call, all the health and safety leaders that have worked so hard over the past three years to protect their workers and keep their workplaces safe. Um, your leadership has saved lives and you are to be acknowledged and thanked. Um, we are today standing in the shadow of a pandemic that claimed a million American lives on American soil. That is devastating. And I really believe we are on the precipice of a golden age in health and safety, uh, where our employees are expecting more from employers on these topics and where we are positioned to move from reacting to an emergency to acting to continue to strengthen our, the health and safety of our work, workers and our workplaces. And so I encourage everyone here to really lean in and embrace this exciting time um, in workplace health and safety and continue to advocate for the types of long-term systemic improvements that you know are mission critical, not just in times of emergency, but all the time. Uh, for your workers and the communities uh, where you operate. Um, one last note, uh, I'm excited to share that tomorrow, uh, NSC and the Health Action Alliance are co-hosting an event uh, featuring Dr. Ashish Jha, the White House Coronavirus uh, Coordinator. Uh, my colleague is dropping a link into the chat. Uh, the, that event is gonna look at emerging workplace health trends heading into next year and excited to have Dr. Jha there and invite all of the folks on today's call to to join us. It's free uh, and it's taking place tomorrow at 2 p.m. Um, and finally, just say thank you, Tony, to you and the other panelists for uh, inviting me to be here today. I think this is such an important topic and we're thrilled to be uh, NSC's partner. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, again, you, you, you know, the point that you made is, uh, is an excellent one, as is well the ones that were made by Joyce and, and Janetta. You know, we are standing on the precipice uh, at the same time, we don't want to make sure that this is an exercise in Sisyphus, right? We don't want to make sure that we are rolling this rock up the hill only to have it roll it and crush us back down and have to roll this back up again. And so I think the things that you have done through the Health Action Alliance and the, the tools and resources and, and commentary that Joyce and Janetta that you've provided uh, will really help us make sure that we you know, that this rock doesn't come rolling back down the hill the next time that, you know, we are really at the, at the precipice, as, as Stephen mentioned, and are gonna be able to get to the other side of that and be better prepared and, and you know, more agile and more responsive uh, the next time that a crisis uh, you know, comes, comes along, again, un unfortunately. So again, uh, one last virtual round of applause and, and thanks to our distinguished panelists here today. Uh, for the first panel, uh, uh, again, Stephen and Joyce and Janetta, and there's an opportunity, as I think Stephanie mentioned, to put any questions or comments that you have in the chat and we'll be able to take an opportunity after this uh, session today, connect you with those individual panelists. So again, my sincere thanks for the preparation and the, and the time and attendance uh, for, for Joyce and Janetta and Stephen. Again, thank you all for your participation today and wish you the greatest of uh, the rest of your day today. Right. Happy holidays, thank everyone. Thanks. All right, happy thanks, holidays. Too. You know, one of the things that we heard from that group was, uh, you know, in terms of crisis management, we're talking about uh, preparing for the future. Uh, and so whether it's back to the future or you know, to, to steal a, you know, a, a cliche or a phrase frequently used by the other thought leadership group within the National Safety Council, you know, we talk about the future of VHS. 
and really the future is now. Uh, you know, that's I think is something that we heard resoundingly from those three panelists in our most recent discussion is, you know, the way to plan for the future is to act today. And so the next panel is going to do a little bit more of that, continue along the, again, the theme of the workplace. Uh, again, recognizing that the workforce is a key component of the workplace. Uh, but again, talking about what are some of the things that we have seen organizations do and how they've responded, what are the things that we recommend that workplaces do and, and how they respond, again, to prepare for the future, because the future doesn't happen, uh, you know, to avoid that kind of crisis management uh, in preparing in the middle of, an, an, you know, a, a, a pandemic, right, uh, kind of build a plane as you're flying it or, you know, build a bus as you're, as you're driving it. How do we make the future of EHS now and today and take actions today? So again, with that, uh, going to transition to our final panel for uh, discussion for today and for this two-day virtual summit. And the final pandemic, uh, sorry, the final uh, panel here is about hybrid work and the workplace culture. Again, I want to thank you for, for attending the distinguished panelists. Again, it's a great opportunity for you to share your insights. Again, you've got a breadth of, of knowledge and experience uh, among a variety of workforces here in the U.S. And, and again, to some extent, you have uh, international experience. I ask you that you contribute that experience and insights as well. You know, again, the, the, the workplaces and the workforces of the future are taking shape as we speak, right? The future of EHS and the EHS workforce is here and, and present today. And it's clear that these hybrid environments, again, one that I think all three of us, uh, all three of you on the panel and, and, and me, myself, uh, you know, are, are living through today, right? We are in a hybrid environment where some of us are in a workplace, some of us are in a workplace full time, some of us are teleworking full time, some of us you know, kind of have a mixed in environment. You know, and there's a cultural assessment and cultural aspect associated with that. Uh, again, and, and, mu and much of that needs to be done deliberately to continue to energize that culture as we move forward. Again, so, th so to the uh, participants, right, in this session, you'll hear from our human resources, labor, and safety and health leaders on how to build a safe, compassionate, and effective culture for 2023 and beyond. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our three panelists for today. First, I'd like to introduce Richard Stone. Richard serves as the Vice President of Environment, Health, and Safety for the National Safety Business Group at Amentum. Richard's worked in the EHS field for over 30 years in diverse environments, including the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, academia, research, and private consulting. His experience includes solving technical industrial hygiene challenges and managing mixed waste in Hanford site and at the Hanford site and directing a safety industrial hygiene and occupational medicine team at an OSHA VPP star worksite, which successfully completed its mission to safely destroy chemical weapon stockpiles. Also want to introduce today, Sam Chappell. Sam is the founding director at Shirley Parsons North America, an EHS professional services firm that works, that provides consultancy, executive search, recruitment, and staffing services to companies around the world. After spending a couple of years working in the company's UK recruitment business, Sam relocated to Boston in 2014 to open Shirley Parsons North America headquarters. His diverse team of 40 employees, including myself, uh, has since provided career consultation to more than 20,000 EHS professionals across the region and has partnered with thousands of EHS executives to help them achieve their company's goals. Finally, Nicole Schif Schifrin. Uh, Nicole has attended the University of Georgia, graduating with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and then pursued an MS and a PhD in Industrial Organizational Psychology at Auburn University with a focus on occupational health and safety. Since graduating, Nicole has returned as a visiting professor at Auburn, teaching an occupational health psychology course. She also works at Common Spirit Health as a people insights analyst, where she analyzes the organization's workforce data for trends that can be acted upon and improve the efficiency and culture. Again, welcome panelists. Thank you for being here today. We're gonna get right into the questions again. So I encourage the audience uh, to participate by putting your questions that you may have in the chat. We've got a, a set of uh, predetermined questions that we're gonna use to curate this discussion with our panelists today, but certainly again, should have plenty of time to address any of the comments that the people in the audience may have. So please put those in the chat and we will circle through and get those to the panelists here today. So we're gonna hop right into it. Sam, the first question is for you. What are 
things that your company has been doing in regards to hybrid work and work from home? Thanks, Tony. Yeah, so um, we were quite fortunate being a professional services firm that uh, shifting to work from home was relatively easy. We, um, we have a few offices dotted around North America, and um, I was always, despite being a millennial, very against working from home pre-pandemic. So we, we were trialing it out uh, for about two months before the pandemic hit one day a week and then we went straight to, to five days a week from home um, because we spend a lot of time in front of laptops and over the phone uh, speaking with clients and candidates it wasn't too difficult a switch um, in terms of operational changes uh, but we over the last almost three years now i guess uh, have had to work with um yeah, the, the, the kind of initial switch was very, very easy, right? Like go and do your job as you were doing it in the office, but just do it from home instead. But then the unintended consequences of that, uh, particularly around culture, training, um, they, they were two big things that I was worried about before the pandemic. And then when it hit, uh, we were in crisis mode for about three months. Um, but since then, it's how do we bring people into the, a team that is remote? Um, particularly if we're hiring more junior employees or people who maybe are coming straight out of school who just don't have the, the knowledge and the experience to, to work uh, in our space. Uh, so how do we firstly train them? And then secondly, how do we keep people engaged and motivated and, and feel like they're part of a larger organization? Uh, we have 40 people here. We have about 200 or so globally. Um, and that was uh, a, not so much of a struggle to begin with. I think everyone was quite happy just to keep working and, and uh, keep the lights on as it were. But um, we have been very deliberate. Uh, it, it's taken a lot more management overhead to uh, provide what our employees need to, to, to A, develop the skills and be feel like they're valued here. So the, the stuff that kind of happened by chance, uh, serendipity in the office, you kind of run into people, say, hello, how are you doing? Um, or, you know, little corrections here and there, or, you know, pat on the back for good work done. All of that just went out the window with uh, remote work. Uh, so having that problem, uh, the, the way we dealt with it was just putting dedicated time aside every single day uh, for, for meetings. Um, we then had uh, a bit of pushback on that. No one likes sitting in Zoom meetings uh, all day long. So we've ebbed and flowed with the balance of, of what's needed. Uh, but that has been an interesting uh, couple of years. We're now, we're now back in the office and we're, we're working hybrid and uh, it seems to work quite well. We still bring uh, new hires in to the office for about the first three to six months, depending on how quickly they develop. Um, but have found actually giving people that freedom to work from home with a hybrid setup uh, has not been detrimental at all. I was completely wrong uh, that it was it was something that people couldn't do work from home. They've they've proven me very wrong, and I'm glad they did because uh, yeah, now we we've been incredibly busy as you can imagine. Recruitment over the last two years has been booming and um yeah that that kind of remote work angle has been a godsend for us it means that we can now recruit people further afield um tony you're not near one of our offices but you've joined the team and slotted straight in i didn't have the same worries uh as it as it were with regards to experience with you but um with uh building that culture we've we've had to increase budgets around um bringing people together uh, there is no substitute, in my opinion, for, for that face-to-face -face interaction that you get uh, to build relationships, build trust, and to ultimately deliver on the goals of a, of a company. So, so that's what we've done. Um, it, it was a relatively easy switch uh, and then just a lot of deliberate management that maybe you wouldn't have had to think about three years ago uh, that now we're putting budgets and time into to make sure that we're keeping people engaged and uh, trained up to where they need to be. 
Great. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Richard, the next question is going to be for you, but uh, go to Nicole first. Nicole, anything to add to uh, anything that, that Sam mentioned? Again, again, I've got a uh, student in college and a, and, a, and a student in high school, so again, some of those cultural things are obviously different from in, in a higher education environment, but what are things that you've seen either in higher education or elsewhere uh, to amplify or to supplement some of the things that Sam was mentioning? Yeah, thank you, Tony. So I do work remotely, but I am not involved in designing or the way we sort of carry out the hybrid and remote work schedule for both of the organizations that I work for. So I really don't think I can speak to those necessarily, but I do completely agree with the sentiment that was just shared and that I think a lot of people were really hesitant to see organizations go remote or hybrid all at once on a large scale. And there was a lot of sense of mistrust almost from management about how employees were going to be working from home, how they were going to be using their time, if they were really going to be doing what they have said that they're doing. And just since that's begun, we have a lot of data from various organizations and industries to show that people have maintained being productive and some organizations and industries even see increased productivity since remote work has begun. Um, and we see that sense of distrust and maybe skepticism starting to go away now that it's been a couple of years since we've made this large migration over to hybrid and remote work. Great, thanks, Nicole. Uh... You know, and Rich, you could certainly follow up on anything that Sam mentioned, but I'm going to uh, preload the, the next question for you so you can certainly blend in your response to the, the response for this question. So the, the question that I have for you then is, uh, how has the pandemic or hybrid work changed the, culture, the safety culture, you know, whether it be organizational culture or safety culture? And also, how has it changed the role of the EHS professional? Yeah, thanks. Uh... Thanks a lot uh, for the question. And just go back to the other question really quick. It was a little harder for us to uh, transition since we have now, I think about 45,000 employees, uh, but we have a lot of the support contracts, uh, especially with our crit critical missions business line that, that require a lot of on-site work. So it was, it was, a, it was a big challenge uh, for us. Um, you know, someone has to turn the wrenches, right? So um, we can't have 100% uh, hybrid workforce all the time, and a lot of folks are in that position as well. So, um, again, uh, great, great sharing. Uh, Sam and Nicole agree 100%. Uh, on the the second the second question here, um, how has uh, the pandemic or, or hybrid work changed the culture of the workplace? Um, and and then again, how it's impacted the role of the safety of our safety professionals. Um, so let me get the negatives out of the way first. Um, <laughs> You know, I believe the pandemic's kind of given many of our employees kind of a sense of entitlement uh, that they should be able to work from home. Uh, I think that's almost like an expectation now, right? So um, I think that's, that's, a, that's, that's, that's an issue we've had to overcome, uh, that sense of entitlement that, that, you know, hey, look, it's just normal, right? We're all working from home, or at least some work from home. Uh, but I think it's also polarized the workforce to some extent, um, the, the pandemic in general, um, due to masking and vaccine requirements. Um, there's much more conflict and tension and, and probably less trust. And our safety professionals have had to bridge that, that, that trust differential and uh, kind of overcome some of these, these gaps that, that have developed because of the pandemic. So that's been a big challenge for our EHS professionals. Um, so let's talk about some of the positive things. Um, you know, obviously we now know how to be much more agile and nimble and adept um, and, and, and we even know how to, to, to have successful and impromptu meetings with Teams or Zoom or WebEx or whatever it might be. You know, we're much more tech savvy now. Um, that's a big benefit for me <laughs> um, and, and, and a lot of our EHS professionals. So, you know, they've learned to become more tech savvy, which is, I, I think, left us um, stronger and better able to cope with, with um, you know, the rapid change in needs of our, uh, our business. Um, also, you know, I can touch on this during the challenges of implementing a hybrid work schedule, but um, the role of EHS professionals, I think, has really shifted to require more creative ways to, to engage our employees. Um, engagement is so important. Um, and I, we'll talk about it later on, but, um, um, you know, making sure that our folks have adequate training that our initiatives are implemented, that you know, they're conducting employee observations, near-miss, good catch reporting. Um, 
and those other engagement activities that are important, at least for us as a company, for leading indicators, um, trying to keep those employees engaged in a hybrid work environment has been a big challenge for our EHS professionals. Um, so that, that's, I think that's, if I was gonna pick one thing, um, as far as a role uh, or safety professionals, I think that's, that's been a big change. How do we get those people engaged? How do we keep our employees engaged when they're not in the workplace? We don't have direct interaction with them um, because employee engagement is so important. Um, I think also it's, uh, um, it's changed the culture of the workplace by um, improving our interface and, and communication and knowledge of even who to talk to um, from our local community health organizations. So, you know, we now have contacts, our EHS professionals have contacts and we know how to interact and pull data and give data, share information with our, our, our community health uh, org organizations. And then uh, I think, uh, you know, um, above all, the EHS role of professionals has been really expanded. And I think this is the most important, maybe most important point of all is that um, it has, better understanding of the EHS role by our, our, our senior leadership, our project leadership. Um, I think it's provided some expanded opportunities um, for other EHS improvement measures. Um, and it's an opportunity to show that us as EHS professionals are really a value add uh, to our senior leadership. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's been a big change. Great, thanks, Rich. You know, the one comment that you made uh, is exactly what was mentioned in the in the last panel discussion by Stephen, talking about companies are now becoming uh, an element in or, or a key component in uh, the community public health organization, where they, again that those relationships that may not have previously existed do exist now, and again they become a, a critical piece of that community and public health infrastructure. So the, your point is certainly well made there. Uh, a, a point you made earlier about, you know, a sense of entitlement, you know, you look at uh, whether it be the insights that Shirley Parsons has recently published or the salary survey that the National Safety Council has also recently published, you know, the, the National Safety Council's insights talked about 50% of the employees or the individuals that responded to that survey talk about being full time in the workplace, right? We look at our critical infrastructure and our critical uh, organizations that are critical industries like construction and manufacturing to the, you know, to the industries that I've most recently served in. Uh, and, and there is very limited opportunity for, uh, you know, remote working again. So there's not so much a sense of entitlement, but to your point where people are looking to return to work or looking for other opportunities, uh, you know, sometimes there may be a, a mystique or a, just a misunderstanding about some of that work can only be done. Like you said, it really in the factory or on a construction site or, or other types of things. Sam, I'm going to ask you for anything that you've seen in terms of a transition. We talk about employees versus employers' expectations. Anything that you've seen when you were dealing with companies that are looking for safety professionals in terms of has there been a transition in what they've identified as some of the key responsibilities or key competencies that they are expecting employees to have uh, in, their next, in, their, in their hiring practices? Yeah, so the the transition um, to to kind of piggyback on on Rich's point, certainly candidates have been much quicker to to demand or ask about hybrid or remote work than employers have been uh, willing to offer that to to the market. So it has been um, a slow transition, but we are seeing more uh, of these uh, remote, fully remote roles um, or semi-remote depending on um the requirements for a role so like you said tony that there are still uh, a, a vast proportion of the jobs that we're working on that are out in the market right now for ehs professionals are site-based um, you need to be there visible engaging with employees face-to-face -face, delivering training um, and all of that cannot be done through a screen um, it's it's just not possible so we uh there was definitely an, a, an influx early on of that desire uh it has slowed down a bit i think as the reality is has hit home that that isn't possible um but for sure we're, we're seeing uh a lot of companies now requiring people to be able to to work from home 
if if the needs arise right if if there is another shutdown if there is a um you know the need to to send some people home that ability to work remotely uh is required and, and that's something we we also now require as a business um it's sensible right if you want, you're talking about business continuity um you need people with that skill set and i don't think everybody has it you know of my opinion um don't crucify me but it is it is hard to stay focused when you're you're at home uh so that is now there a little but those single site roles they have not changed or or even um it's really the traveling roles where maybe you're covering mul multiple sites where there is a little bit more flexibility now whereas previously you would be based out of one of the facilities and traveling 50 percent of the time um say you worked for a manufacturing company um and covering a, a region now there is a little bit more flexibility from employers who are, are maybe seeing how tight the labor market is um and it's i don't think it's really come from a desire for skills um as such more of uh what they're seeing in the market and how difficult it can be to recruit people currently um so it, it's more about out of a a necessity than a and uh, a desire to to do that if that makes sense yeah great thanks sam so so nicole uh, so whether it's out of necessity or out of uh you know companies coming to the realization that hybrid work is not going to just pass over you know that they may have tried to wait it out and thought well we can kind of hobble this along on uh chewing gum and bailing wire uh what are some things that you're seeing companies need to take into consideration or need to put in place if they haven't already? Again, hopefully they have, but to the extent that they may have not, what are really some key considerations that companies need to need to take into consideration for hybrid work? Again, whether that be ergonomics, uh, psychological safety, or inclusion. Uh, you know, one of the other things that is certainly relevant, especially to small organizations, is cybersecurity. Uh, again, I've worked for large organizations, the Department of the Navy and, and Boeing and now Shirley Parsons, again, international companies that really have a focus on cybersecurity. But, uh, you know, that may go by the way, Sarah, maybe a kind of an afterthought for, for some companies. What are some of the things that you've seen that companies really need to take in and, and put into practice if they haven't already? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Richard touched earlier on sort of the role of the health and safety specialist expanding and becoming broader and encompassing more aspects of the work environment like engagement, and now maybe even things like cybersecurity. Um, so there's a lot to touch on here, but working from home even just part of the time results in an entirely different kind of work environment that's not managed in the same way that we manage traditional work environments and of course safety is no exception here um, so just to touch on a few categories of safety that we've seen being managed differently for remote workers and this includes physical safety psychological safety and cyber safety um, and regarding physical safety, it may off the bat seem as though organizations don't have much control over the physical environment of their remote workers, um, but employers actually can play a large role in creating an ergonomically safe workspace that helps employees avoid those common ergonomic injuries that are triggered by desk work, generally those related to the neck and back and knees and wrists. Um, and we see that with the rise of remote work, the rate of ergonomic injuries has been increasing. There are still people working from their dining room tables um, and chairs several years into working from home. And this, a lot of people are just simply unaware of how different positionings of office equipment in relation to their bodies and impact their bodies because you know the physical workspace like maybe at a corporate office already has equipment that's designed to facilitate the way we interact with our workspace um, and at home maybe people don't already have that kind of thing set up and in an ideal world organizations would just be able to purchase ergonomic chairs and keyboards and desks and mice and all of that for the remote workers to create a setup that's best designed to facilitate sort of physical health and avoid injury um, but the reality is that this isn't feasible for most employers. And of course, while it would be nice, we don't really need $3,000 chairs and specialized equipments to make a pretty big impact in reducing sort of the discomfort or potential injury from working from home. Um, 
simply just educating goes a really long way in this case and having sort of short trainings that demonstrate the best ways to position your body in relation to your workspace teaches people how to properly interact with their workspace and really gets them thinking about you know how they're sitting how they're positioning themselves and the impact that it has on their bodies um, and there are pretty cool opportunities to get creative when designing ergonomic workspaces from home, sort of correct postures and positioning. So, for example, if someone watches a little training put out by their organization telling them that their feet should be flat on the floor when sitting at their desk, they could grab a shoebox or a yoga block and put it under their feet, make it touch the ground, maybe their knees will feel better. Um, so just simple solutions like this. There are also a lot of softwares out there now that monitor working patterns and can sort of prompt regular breaks or provide tips to avoid stiffness and injury. Um, so all of this to say that it doesn't take a lot of money to support physical safety um, for remote workers. And that's one of the areas that we're seeing maybe a little bit more harm being done in as people work longer hours a lot of the time working from home it's easy to just like sit at your desk stare at the computer all day co-workers aren't coming by to distract you and get you standing up and going for a walk um, and i know i ramble on that for a minute so i'm just going to move on to psychological safety um, which is believing that you can share your thoughts and feelings without any risk of retaliation or shame or other interpersonal consequences that come from either your coworkers or leaders that you work with um, and something that we've started seeing more of as organizations have transitioned to hybrid or remote schedules is feelings of isolation and disconnection from other team members and just less interpersonal openness in work groups. Um, and psychological safety is characterized by feelings of respect and trust and acceptance with those that you work with and those around you. And when, if we've only ever interacted with people through a webcam, developing psychological safety can be more of a challenge and feeling comfortable enough to speak up to people you don't feel like you maybe necessarily trust or know that well can be more of a challenge. Um, because a lot of the ways, and this has already been touched on as well, that we develop closeness and trust within our teams is through those more casual activities like water cooler chats and those spur of the moment conversations we have as people are walking in. And without those anymore, um, everything feels more formal and structured and it just makes it more difficult to open up. So organizations virtually creating some kind of casual space to allow people to get to know each other um, can make a big difference in encouraging psychological safety. Um, and a lot of, you know, the culture of psychological safety falls on leaders of remote teams. So really putting it on leaders of remote teams to create a sense of community and belonging um, on virtual teams will go a long way. And then finally, real quick, I just wanted to touch on cyber safety. This isn't really something that I initially would have thought about when thinking of um, EHS professionals, but with the increase of remote work, there is a growing need to understand the digital safety behaviors of remote workers um, and cyber attack risks and events have been increasing since um, employees connect virtually to organizations' networks. And IT departments, they put out trainings to avoid phishing and creating strong passwords and so on. But I think where health and safety and behavioral specialists can contribute to this work is understanding the different physical and environmental conditions that impact the risk of people slipping up when it comes to cyber safety. For example, research shows that employees who are sleep deprived or fatigued are more likely to fall victim to external threats like cyber um, phishing or malware links. Um, and so taking these kinds of things into consideration when thinking about how we're designing the remote work environment is going to be really critical. And I think that's where we can play a role in sort of the cyberspace safety. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Again, all three of those certainly resonate with uh, you know, my personal work experience of my current employer, past employer, you know, uh, maybe in reverse order to one of the things that you mentioned about cybersecurity is, you know, some of us. You know, we're all on a screen right now with, with you know, nobody in the background. We've told uh, pets and loved ones to kind of leave us alone for the next hour or so. But, you know, you know, some of those things that literally, you know, those individuals are in our workspaces or maybe in our, in our homes. And, you know, so walking by an open screen or an open monitor with, you know, sensitive information from an organization 
you know, or whether we're doing our work in a, you know, in a place that's other than our home or other than protected, just that type of exposure alone is, again, is uh, again, something that people may or may not think about. Uh, the other thing that you touched on really has really resonates both the leader's role uh, and, again, something that, Sam, I'm going to go to you in a second, but, you know, a comment that, Sam, that you made about investing in, you know, it's going to take a little bit extra money to, to invest in that, you know, and, and leaders also uh, need to play a critical role in that, you know, to create that kind of a culture. You know, that's something that I've heard in, in, from previous employers is, well, if you don't, you know, we're not going to spend any more money. And if you don't like uh, the arrangement that you have at home or if you don't like, the, you know, if you have a sense of isolation, well, then you can just come into the office. And that's not necessarily the most ideal response um, from a from a worker, you know, from a from a work and, and employer relationship. And that's those are some of the things that really help see employees, uh, you know, look forward to the to, to the exit sign or you know to the door more so than feeling a sense of belonging. Um, Sam, anything else you just want to touch on in terms of making that deliberate investment? Uh, and then Rich, over to you for the next question. But, but Sam, anything you wanted to add to what Nicole mentioned? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, the, the point around three thousand dollar chairs, right? Like, there's, I think if you were ordering stuff um, in that first six months of the pandemic with all the supply chain issues, it was very expensive even to get something that was quite cheap quality wise. But the cost is is minimal. I mean, we can set people up for you know, with some of the best equipment around for under a thousand dollars, and uh, it should last them hopefully indefinitely, a lot of it, right? The table, chair, uh, risers, things like that. Um, and the cost of you know, $1,000 is, is less than we're spending on an office space, right? So we, we've actually relocated, we've downsized our office and uh, you, know, from budget, you can reassign budgets from elsewhere. Um, it's a little harder if you're in long-term leases or you own your own properties, things like that, obviously, but uh, there are, it, the cost is definitely not as high as uh as you might have thought if you were looking into this six months into the pandemic um but yeah those those budgets for us are, are relatively minimal it is the the traveling around and, and getting people face to face uh for sure that that has increased quite a bit so it's trying to build reasons around that whether it's training whether it's networking learning events at conferences uh, for example, where we can send a bunch of people and, and kill two birds with one stone, as it were, get training and, and uh, invest in people that way um, is how we've, we've gone about managing the, the budget side. Great. Thanks, Sam. Rich, on to you for the next question. And I'm going to infuse a question that came in from the audience into this. Uh, the preloaded question is just overall and in general, what challenges have you seen with implementing hybrid work? at your company and, and how have you navigated those challenges? The added uh, addendum from the audience is specifically with regards to home safety compared to office safety. You know, how are you managing the home safety element and, and component and, and very specifically how that relates to workers' compensation? So, you know, navigating the challenges of hybrid work with a, with a little bit of an extra uh, attention on home safety and, and an arrangement in association with workers' compensation. Yeah, Tony, I think the, that's a great question from the audience, uh, whoever provided that question. Thanks. It's, it's a good question because um, something that we get a lot um, and, and there's a lot of gray areas now, right, uh, as, as we have folks working at home in terms of, you know, one minute they're working on a job specific work-related task and then the next they're maybe minding their kids because they're acting up or you know the dog needs out or whatever it might be um so um it's really important that that we have um when we do have incidents uh, this is the tail wagging the dog part of what go back ideally you want to prevent but um that we have a good investigation process to understand you know what was happening and what, what kind of work was being done but um to answer the question uh, yeah um from a OSHA recordability standpoint, record keeping standpoint, as well as a workman's compensation um, standpoint, um, we do have one an obligation to our employees to, to make sure that we provide a safe working environment for them. Um, we want to keep them safe, but we also, um, you know, the same requirements um, 
for record keeping rules, for example, or workman's comp rules that apply to the home office environment as well. So um, we, we would apply the same set of rules. It's just more difficult at home because, again, of uh, the changing nature of the work and the um, you know, I'm, I'm a remote worker. Um, I, I travel a lot and, you know, I, I may work, um, 15, 20, you know, 15, 20 minutes on one project and then I, I got to run it and take care of, a, 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 something downstairs. Maybe the UPS person comes to the door. So if I go to that door, I go down the stairs from my office and I go to the door to answer that UPS driver, is that work related? Probably not. So how do we as EHS professionals sort those things out? That's that's a challenge um, for for a hybrid and remote work environment. So I don't know if that answers the question, but it's 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 something that we need to provide. That we need to make sure we're providing that that safe work environment, and we're applying the same rules. It's just more challenging. Yeah, it certainly answers that the the audience provided one. Any other challenges that you found besides just the kind of workers' compensation or recordability? Again, Nicole touched on three specific aspects. Uh, anything else that you've seen that has been a challenge with implementing that in, in your uh, in your company? Yeah, so there's several. Um, and Nicole touched on one of them at the very beginning uh, about you know folks' accountability for time. Um, and while I think most folks are pretty honest and pretty accountable, um, you know, accountability is important. And we have to have processes in, in place to make sure that you know folks uh, are are accountable for their time when there's questions that arise. Um, we've had, actually had to let some good people go, really good employees, because they just weren't honest in their timekeeping. And it became apparent um, because of um, lapses in performance and deliverables um, or whatnot. Um, and so the challenge is, is you, know, you, you want to build that trust. So you don't want to act like you don't trust that employee. But but we also have to have the process in place to, when a question does arise, you know, do we have the ability to um, institute time card checks, for example, against work activity. Um, were they logged in? Were they active during the time that you know they 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 put on their time cards? So um, th those are you know those are uh, that accountability things have been been, been been a big challenge. And I know we've all heard this, but I think there's an over dependence on remote meeting platforms, obviously, uh, especially when face to face is not only possible but holds a lot more value. Um, so we should only be scheduling remote meetings when there's no other viable options. Um, and when there's not, we can hold hybrid meetings. Um, and you know, that, that hybrid meeting thing poses another challenge as well. If we have meetings that we're scheduling, um, some people are calling into the meeting, some people are there, and you know, we have to have tech, pretty much technology in all of our meeting spaces, right? So, um, we have to engage the help of our, our IT folks and people that are smarter than me uh, in those areas to make sure that that we've got you know cameras and microphones because if those aren't set up properly, it's just not effective. And that overdependence, I think, leads to a real lack of face time um, and, and opportunities not only to interface with each other but also our customers. We've had challenges with um, you know. Our, even our customers not even be able to meet with us, which obviously is key to business success. Um, and uh, and so I think you know, we just need to schedule more mandatory face-to-face -face meetings. And I think from a hybrid work schedule, it's it's good to require minimum at project time. So you know you have to have so many hours on a project or at, at your at your work site, your office, whatever it might be. Um, and and. And Nicole also mentioned the water cooler um, spur of the moment discussions. You know, if we don't have those in in in, in person face to face meetings, um, you know, that squelches that after meeting meeting uh, or that water cooler talk where you have you want to catch up, you know, with somebody who's at the table, and you know, you can you have another opportunity. So I mean, um, it really doesn't lend themselves to those drop by conversations that are that are really important. Um, the other thing I'll mention uh, is <laughs> communication expectations. So all these platforms, you know, have the chat feature and, and communication features, but especially the younger generation, they assume that everybody is monitoring that chat 100% of the time. So we have, you know, especially younger people, um, but, but folks who are really tech savvy say, look, 
I told you this is what I was going to do in the chat. Well, me, I don't always look at the chat. Many of our folks don't look at it at all. We have no no clue that you know that that was the expectation or that was being conducted. So I, I think you know we as supervisors, as EHS professionals, need to make sure we're clear on you know what are our communication expectations uh, and and how do we communicate because um, it's not clear. People just assume that. You know, everybody's watching all these techno new, te new technology platform, which I, quite frankly, it's, it's tough to keep track of them all, right? So some people use Zoom, some people use Teams, and if you join a different... may have a uh, an issue with Rich's mic. Mike, uh, you got a technology problem. I think I've got it fixed. There we go. Yeah, you're, you're good. Where I, uh, I must have touched something. It's, I told you I'm not very tech savvy, so. <laughs> um, that was probably me, but but training. I'll just cut back to training. Um, and we have a number of training programs that form the bedrock of our safety culture. And uh, we just haven't been able to crack the code on, on those yet. Um, there's there's some that we just haven't been able to to learn to do even after a couple of years of trying. Uh, so we've been trying to redevelop our training programs like a lot of folks. So I think that's a big challenge for for us and our EHS professionals. Great, thanks, Rich. Uh, Nicole, I'm going to come to you with the next uh, question. I'm going to combine a couple and uh, maybe feed some extra content in here from the some of the things we've just heard. One is, you know, how can a hybrid work contribute to a culture of safety in the workplace? You know, so you think about uh, for those, let's say, you know, take the true definition of hybrid, meaning half at home, half, you know, or, or a percentage at home and a percentage in the brick and mortar uh, establishment of the company. How do you make sure that the individuals remember, hey, when I go to the work site, these are the expectations? You know, Rich talked a little bit about, you know, training and, and making sure people are, 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 you know, reminded of that. So well, that's one component. The second half of that question is uh, just the general health and safety of the workforce. You know, is there something uh, you know that's unique about splitting time between a home environment and a brick and mortar environment of, of the of the company? Does that in any way affect uh, the workforce? So a cultural element, and then a physical and kind of mental health element of having to split time uh, between two work locations. Sure, so I'll start with the cultural element of safety. Um, I think we generally hear about how hybrid and remote work settings can negatively impact organizational culture. And it's true that remote work does have some cultural challenges, especially when it's so new to the way that we're experiencing the workplace. But there are plenty of ways that remote work can contribute to culture positively and help build a culture of safety. And I think I'm gonna approach this from a slightly different perspective. And I'm interested in hearing Richard and Sam's perspectives on this as well. Um, but I think that one of the huge benefits of creating hybrid work schedules is that they're essentially designed to put the employee first and they prioritize the health and well being um, and work life balance of employees by sort of allowing them to have more time in their schedules, maybe experience less stress through less commuting, different ways that there are positive impacts on health and well-being. Um, and in grad school, I worked on a paper that showed how flexible working arrangements, such as hybrid or remote, um, different flexible working arrangements have a positive impact on employee health and well-being. Um, it was a modest yet, in my opinion, still really important impact. And other research shows positive impacts of flexible schedules on employee perceptions of the organization and overall well-being. And so how does all of this relate back to a culture of safety? I think it does so in a couple of ways. Um, 
The first is that safety culture is essentially an extension of the overall culture of the organization and is based on all of the different aspects of the work environment, as is any aspect of culture, really. And if employees feel that their well-being is supported by the organization and they're a priority for the organization they're, and they're having an overall positive experience, they're more likely to be engaged in the work that they do. Um, and this enhanced engagement also carries over to better engagement and safe behaviors and following safety uh, protocol at work. Um, and then the second way I think that these are related is that the state of employees' health and well-being are directly related to engagement and performance, like safety performance at work. If you're tired or sick or burnt out, those employees are going to be the most likely to make mistakes um, and less likely to engage in the proper safety protocols at work. So the more an organization prioritizes the health and well-being of its workforce, the better safety outcomes we'll see. And of course, this is just a small piece of the puzzle. Like we just talked about the training that goes into it and sort of all the expectations that are set and the ways that we communicate expectations around um, the proper safety behaviors to engage in. But I think at baseline, what hybrid work really offers is that it has a positive impact on employee health and well being and work life boundaries. And that in and of itself facilitates a culture of safety and just engaged employees who participate in um, proper safety behaviors. And the second part of that question was how does hybrid work affect? health and well-being. And I kind of touched on this a little bit too, but there's also another side to the story because like what's tricky about any work environment is that it doesn't impact everybody in the same way. So for some people, a hybrid schedule is great for their well-being and work-life balance because it reduces commute time, leaves people with more time to engage in hobbies and personal or household responsibilities ultimately leaving people less stressed and with more time on their hands, which is one of the really big benefits of hybrid and remote work schedules. Um, but even though flexible working arrangements in general have a positive impact on health and well-being, there are still pockets of the population that hybrid work isn't having a positive impact on in terms of health and well-being. Um, and something that we're seeing is that some people are burning out a lot faster working from home, whether that's all of the time or just part of the time, because there are less clear boundaries between the workday and their personal time. So it can be really easy to hop on the computer first thing in the morning, work late into the night if you have trouble setting those boundaries for yourself. And more importantly, if your work doesn't respect your work-life boundaries and doesn't really allow you to start, you know, at nine and end at five when you would expect to. If people are emailing you outside of working hours or when you're on vacation or just, um, you know, encouraging you to work late into the night, even if it means you're going to lose sleep. Sort of those cultural aspects of hybrid work that some organizations are seeing are having negative impacts on workers. Um, and so just taking into consideration how different behaviors from leaders, coworkers, and just everyone that's like interacting with each other, how those behaviors reinforce work-life boundaries for employees um, really makes or breaks how the hybrid or remote work structure is going to impact health and well-being. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Sam, the next question is going to be for you, so I'll switch it over to Rich for any feedback that he has, and then, and then Sam, you can provide any feedback. Uh, and then we'll head into the next question. But Rich, anything that you want to add or, or responses that, you know, things that Nicole touched on that, that resonated with you? Yeah, you know, I, I think overall, I think hybrid work generates job satisfaction, which improves our safety culture overall. And uh, so and I agree with a lot of what she said. Um, the, the one thing, um, you know, I will say, I think the jury's still out um, on whether hybrid schedules really are. Uh, great for mental health and well-being. Uh, I think overall it probably is, um, but uh, on one hand it provides that flexibility like, like, like Nicole was talking about, but we still have the same challenges that Nicole mentioned. Um, you know, we, we have family conflicts, space sharing, uh, like we said, some people are still working from their coffee, from their dining room tables, right? So we still have some of those problems. Um, so I think, I think the jury's still out. I think overall it's a positive thing, but Great. 
Thanks, Rich. You know, yeah, hopefully that, uh, you know, the, hopefully that jury is not looking like 12 angry men, um, you know, but again, we think that there's probably, it's probably split uh, down the middle, but uh, again, I think there will continue to be some concerns, but, you know, we, we will look and try and, uh, you know, solve those issues as, as they continue to arise. Sam, any, any comment or feedback that you have on the points that Nicole made? Uh, and then we'll go into your next question. But but first, any re any responses or any feedback to, to what Nicole mentioned? I think just reiterating uh, the point around trust. I think uh, it, it is hard um, to get the balance right. Uh, but yeah, that, that point around trust, there's a good analogy uh, that Toby Lutke uses. He's the CEO and founder of Shopify. Um, he talks about a trust battery where, um, you know, if you're asking you know, within within the uh, confines of an organization, you have to build trust to then draw upon it later. It's like charging a battery, right? So if you're giving, you're trusting people to work from home, um, you're trusting people to get their jobs done, focusing on outcomes as opposed to, uh, you know, how long were they logged in and activity tracking, that kind of thing, which doesn't imply a ton of trust. Uh, hopefully that you're building up that trust battery that you can then draw on later when you're asking them to do other tasks or follow a process that uh, maybe is safer for them, but they don't fully understand why. So you're, you're gaining that um, you're gaining that trust by allowing people to to work from home, giving them that flexibility that hey, they might go the extra mile for you um, down the line. And yeah, where where that line is on you know, can you email people after five? Should they be responding? If you do, uh, that's going to be company by company. And um, I, mean, I say to people whenever they start, if I send you an email late at night, I'm not expecting a response. I'm just getting a piece of work off my desk. So uh, maybe that sets the tone that I'm expecting people to work late, but um, that is hard. That is tough to get right. You know, personally, I've never seen an issue with it you know, for, for me and my own career progression, um, I go the extra mile and that, that's served me well. I'd encourage other people to do the same, but not to the detriment of their health. So that's, that's difficult to get right. But yeah, certainly the, the trust that you build with employees by allowing them to work from home and giving them that flexibility, uh, is something you can draw on down the line if you do it in the right way. Yeah, thanks, Sam. I mean, to your point, mate, you know, is uh, well combined with a, a comment that Rich had made too, too, in terms of entitlement, you know, it is an element of trust, right? It's, you know, whether the employee sees it as an entitlement or whether the employer, the supervisor, manager sees it as an element of trust, I think, you know, I think it's important for both sides to kind of see uh, both those perspectives, you know, that the employee, whether they feel it's an entitlement or not, there is a component of trust uh, again, and, and that's a, a trust battery that works in, in both directions, right? That there is, needs to be, you know, put on put on charge when it's when it's necessary. Again, so that it can be drawn upon later. Uh, so the answer to the next question, you highlighted a little bit about this or talked a little bit about it in a previous response, but I'm going to ask the question uh, again. Anything that you want to add in terms of has the hybrid uh, work environment or hybrid, uh, you know, kind of working arrangements that companies offer, how is that impacted? talent management and talent recruitment. Has it really impacted in a, uh, in a positive or in a, in a detrimental way, uh, you know, the recruiting of uh, future talent? It, it has. Um, it's, it's really the, the talent retention piece that has been hardest. Like I said, those, those companies that have pivoted quickly uh, have done a better job of retaining talent particularly with the inflationary environment that we're still in uh there are and you know the tight labor market there are opportunities out there for people and so if you are not at least trying to to work this into your talent strategy somehow uh there is the the downside that you're going to put probably 50 percent of people off even applying for your jobs so you know if you're if you're fine with that and that's that works for your organization and that's what you need then hey that's that's fine and it's just not a fit um but yeah we've we've definitely seen uh an increase in people who are have maybe been on the road or living in places they didn't want to live but were doing it for the job 
um, there are opportunities out there now for them that they can look at. Uh, so yeah, it, it, in terms of strategy around talent, um, I would certainly recommend looking at how to build that in. And uh, the survey we did recently, uh, we looked at satisfaction that, that candidates had with their work from home allowance. Uh, and anyone who had none whatsoever, uh, pretty unsatisfied with it, but there was a very sharp increase in satisfaction, even with one day a week, being able to work from home. So it doesn't have to be, you know, fully remote or 50%. Um, you know, we, we went from having, uh, I think, you know, maybe 10% of people were satisfied, uh, with no days to over 50% with one day a week were happy or very happy with that allowance. So it, it isn't that you need to throw the kitchen sink. It's just, are there things that someone could do if they're writing up reports? Um, you know, could they do that from home as opposed to being at a desk in the, in the office at the back of the facility, right? So, um, if there is any flexibility that you can give by looking at each job and the tasks that are required, that, that would be my recommendation to managers and, and HR teams who are looking to retain talent or attract people to their organization. Great. Thanks, Sam. Uh, got a couple questions from the audience. Uh, the first one I'll throw out to all three of the uh, panelists. Each of you have, may have, a, again, a different experience. So certainly don't, don't feel the need to, to uh, provide input if, it, if you don't think it's applicable. But one of them, uh, this really gets to the hybrid work environment of hoteling. So for those of you that may not be familiar but, or the audience members that may not be familiar with that concept, you know, it's a, it's a situation where an organization provides a desk for an employee to work at when in the, you know, brick and mortar facility of the organization, but it's not a dedicated space. It's not like a parking, you know, reserve parking space or a reserve desk where you can put your personal effects. It's you come into the office on a given number of days, or even if it's infrequent, and then you have to uh, do a little bit of hunting and pecking for an open desk. What has anybody seen either experienced that themselves? And, and if so, what may or may not be the positive or negative impacts of uh, a hoteling desk arrangement compared to a dedicated desk arrangement for, for the employees that are doing hybrid work? Uh, I can give it a shot. Uh, we've, so we uh, have a WeWork membership and within that there is an option to have, uh, I think global access to all of their uh, offices. So you can book in advance, you know, there's going to be a space there. Um, and yeah, you know, for a couple of people that are trying to figure out within our team where they want to end up, if they want to go and try living, renting somewhere in say Miami, where we don't have an office space and they want to see if they could set up there. It's a great arrangement for, for them because it means we can just tack that onto our current membership. It doesn't cost us any more than we're already paying. Um, and so that has been um, a nice perk that we can offer to employees again with the goal of retention. Um, difficult to say, we don't have a ton of data uh, from from our, our, our own data or clients as to whether or not that's a, a good thing for the kind of uh, short-term output, but certainly long-term retention, uh, there, are, there are definite benefits there for us. Nicole and Rich, how about you? Anything that you've seen with, you know, hoteling desk arrangements? I don't personally have any experience with hoteling, but I do know that, especially in sort of the beginning phases of remote work before people had maybe more established like office spaces within their homes, people felt really desperate to get out of their home work environment and have somewhere else to work, even if it wasn't necessarily the most ideal like private office cubicle. And there've been a lot of benefits people have seen from those shared workspaces, whether they're like structurally um, organized by the organization itself or one that like you can get a membership to and they're set up similarly where you kind of just show up to a space and you get to work in that environment and it's provided sort of an escape from feeling like cabin fever from working in the same space where you're trying to also live. Um, so I'm not too familiar with like many of the drawbacks from this process, but I know that's one of the big 
benefits that we've been seeing is like giving people that need that escape that don't necessarily have like a physical corporate office to go to, to switch up the environment um, that they're working in. Great. Rich, how about you? Yeah, I just uh, echo Sam's uh, response. I, I don't have any good data on, on, on hoteling or shared workspaces. Um, I don't, I, I, I've never seen any studies done on that uh, myself, but um, certainly we have a lot of shared workspaces that we offer employees that come into work for, on different projects and whatnot. And I think it really gets down to educating the employee about how to set up their workspace. We provide them the proper equipment um, and spaces and, and then making sure that those employees understand the basics, um, the, the few basics that they need to set up that workspace to make sure that it's ergonomically correct, that it's safe and, and well uh, for them. So I think that's that's the key thing that we, we try to emphasize. Yeah, great, thanks, Richie. You know, some things that I've seen, uh, again, not no, no statistical data or necessarily positive or negative, but two things that I've certainly seen uh, from recent employers, but I've also heard other companies do. Uh, one is really help, having the employee be part of that decision-making process. You know, so whether the employer splits that decision at two days in the office or three days in the office, those are usually the uh, kind of the breaking point. Uh, that's what helps determine whether or not you get a hoteling space or a permanent space. Uh, you know, if, if employers feel like if you're going to be in the office two or three days a week and, and consistently, and you know, that we afford you that opportunity and again, that privilege or luxury of having a, a dedicated space. Whereas if you're only gonna be in there one day a week or one day a month or, or infrequently, then it gets back to a little bit to what Nicole mentioned in terms of uh, having a space that uh, you need to go kind of hunt and peck for. You know, One of the other things that I've seen in, in some of the vast organizations where uh, they've really used that return to work, you know, where people were, you know, the office workers uh, were, you know, were, were remote for a long period of time, a year plus, They've used that return to work opportunity to do a little bit of reconfiguration, uh, maybe not gerrymandering per se, but a little bit of reconfiguration of uh, some of the assignment of the prime real estate. Uh, you know, everybody knows in a, in a large office building where the where that prime real estate is. It's either near the coffee machine, or it's got a window, or it's some other type of uh, key element that's associated with that workspace. And if that employee says, "Yeah, I'm going to be in my corner office with a window." Uh, once a month or once a quarter, uh, you know, I've seen organizations, you know, be really deliberate about, okay, we're going to really reconfigure this workspace, uh, again, in the real estate so that people that are going to be here on a permanent basis, they may get a little bit more preference to, uh, you know, what the real estate that they have in terms of their permanent desk. And we're going to take the hoteling spaces and put those, you know, in either, uh, less desirable or, you know, places that may or may not have uh, some of that, you know, direct window access. So certainly those are some of the things that I've seen. Uh, one of the things I wanted to just touch on before we wrap up here, uh, Sam, and again, you certainly manage a virtual workspace and ha have individuals and uh, Nicole, you've also talked a little bit about the same. Any quick tips about uh, ways that you've seen either the use of technology or other ways that we've to, to get employees to collaborate in a more casual space and, you know, to have a uh, kind of a water cooler talk in a virtual environment? Yeah, we've, um, uh, so it is tough. I mean, <laughs> I think the, the younger generation definitely um, have taken to it easier. Um, but the, the, the lessons that we've learned are, you know, with, with particularly onboarding new employees, just trying to set up kind of meet and greet discussions, small groups seems to be quite a nice way to onboard people. Um, we, through the pandemic, uh, ran a few kind of remote office parties where we'd send boxes of, you know, gifts, whether it was, you know, wine and cheese night, and you have someone hosting that evening via Zoom. Uh, it's not quite the same as doing it in person, but it's when there are no other options, it, it's quite a nice way to, to run that, whether it's a quiz or a trivia type event where you can um, develop. You, it, it's never going to be quite the same, that, but it, it does substitute uh, in the short term. If you've got an event coming up in six months and what do you do in the six months to get people to get to know each other? There are small things you can do like that. 
um, for free or, or relatively low cost that have worked well for us. Yeah, great. Thanks, Sam. And Nicole, how about you? Any any other things that you've seen in terms of uh, virtual meetups or virtual uh, engagement opportunities that either have used some type of a platform or or other ways that uh, employees can you know can remain engaged? Yeah. So I totally agree with the setting up like meetings or parties or like potential events to celebrate together. The interesting thing about these more casual conversations or environments that we create virtually they're all still structured and they're all still organized and like have to be put onto the schedule somehow so you'll never just like run into someone spontaneously and be like oh you know fancy seeing you here let's have a spur of the moment conversation and i think that's something that the research is still trying to figure out how to recreate because even if we create these casual settings like you just set up a time with someone to chat not work related not you know anything just like time to catch up things that you were thinking of earlier don't always necessarily come up there in the moment that they always that they would have if you had just been in the office and maybe ran into someone um, so i know a lot of softwares are sort of being tested and designed and like different kinds of virtual avatars that are trying to recreate like a physical work environment but virtually with like avatars and the ability to move around and walk into someone's office um, and none of these have been like extensively tested yet so it's hard to say what the outcomes have been but i think the prospect of that is really cool and maybe creates the opportunity to have these more like spur of the moment conversations that don't necessarily need to be like penciled in as like oh we're having a party or like a casual team meeting at like 1 p.m on friday um you still miss out on some of the spontaneity of that so that's the toughest part to recreate in the virtual environment. Great, thanks, Nicole. Well, again, uh, hour has flown by and certainly great advice. And hopefully, again, the, the participants have felt the same that that really ends the, uh, the types of questions that we've received from the panel, uh, either that were prescribed for the panel or that we've received from the audience. So we're getting ready to uh, wrap this up here. So, so with that, uh, I'm just going to kind of go from my left to right and ask any final thoughts or comments uh, that, you know, that companies or organizations can put in place or any advice to EHS professionals or advice to, to employees, you know, what's the one thing that they can do to help make, you know, what might be the future of hybrid work uh, a success? Rich, I'll start with you. Um, you know, I'll just really go back to my point on engagement, um, you know, if you, if you look at engaged employees, they're, they're essentially, if you look at some of the surveys out there, 70% less likely to have a, a, a safety incident. So finding ways to engage our employees um, in a remote work environment or a hybrid work environment is, is gonna be key, I think, uh, making sure that we can keep that participation going um, is, is key. And then the other thing I would just say in closing is really that, you know, the next bird flu, influenza, pandemic, whatever you want to call it, emergency, it's not going to wait 100 years. So, um, you know, don't let that pandemic plan sit on the shelf that you just updated. You don't let your uh, crisis management team kind of dissolve. Keep it active uh, and keep it brushed off and, and practice to make it a, a reference because, um, you know, not it's important for business con continuity, but also just uh, to make sure that, you know, we're providing uh, that 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 response that we need to when the next when the next event comes and it will come. <laughs> Great, thanks, Rich. Sam, how about you? Any last uh, key insights or tips or, or piece of advice that you'd care to share? I think the, the main one is really just um, I think I, you know, if you haven't done anything yet, you haven't tried hybrid work or remote work in your organization. Uh, it's time to dip your toe in. Uh, we're, we're not all moving on to the metaverse tomorrow, but this is the way things are going. And, and if you're thinking about talent management, whether that's attraction, retention, development, um, there are things you can do now for relatively low cost uh, and not a huge, hopefully, impact on time. But whether that's rethinking job descriptions, um, starting out with one day a month where you can work from home, small things that you can do now to 
just see how it could work in your organization without having a, uh, you know, completely having to completely rework your business. Um, there are a lot of things you can do, and and this is the way it's going. So uh, you can either fight the tide or um, go with it. And uh, you know, if you if you want to have a, a company and staff in particular at your business, um, that would be my primary suggestion. Yeah, thanks, Sam. You know, uh, certainly living up here in the Pacific Northwest, they say you know. With the salmon reference, uh, the strongest fish swim up swim upstream, and so you can be like the salmon, and, and again try and fight that current, you know, fight that current, and, and try and swim upstream. But it does feel like the the propensity of the tide is uh, hybrid work to some degree or another. So again, uh, you know, dipping your toe in the water now is probably uh, a, a good indicator of in preparation for long term success. And Nicole, we'll finish up with you. Uh, any other recommendations or key takeaways that you want to make sure that the uh, the attendees take away with them? Yeah, so I also want to take this opportunity to touch on employee engagement and specifically just paying really close attention to if you have an employee engagement survey, what the data in that survey is telling you. We see engagement surveys becoming more and more common and really engagement's a broad term, but it encompasses a lot of really critical aspects of the organizational culture that we can look into each single one of those and see what's working in our hybrid or uh, remote work environments and what's not working so well. Critical aspects like health and well being, culture of safety, career development, inclusion and belonging. And we can see where people are struggling with sort of feeling these important aspects of culture that are leading them to be less engaged with the work that they're doing and just keeping close tabs on like how these different aspects of engagement are performing and where there are opportunities to go back and try something different like sam had said you know if you haven't tried anything yet or if you're just getting started it's a great way to track how things are going just seeing what the data is telling you when you make a change like has it made a positive impact on this important aspect of culture or has it maybe gotten worse and not done what you thought it was going to do and making adjustments to the way you design the hybrid or remote work environment based on what the employees are telling you in the survey data great thanks nicole and so again with that literally I'd like to uh express my sincere appreciation and, and on behalf of the National Safety Council and uh, again over 200 plus attendees, thank you very much, Rich and Sam and Nicole for sharing your insights, you know, blocking off time on your calendar today to contribute to this valuable conversation. Again, I know that the individuals that did show up today and, and participate and are fully present in this conversation are gonna be able to take away those things. Again, not just put them on a shelf, uh, but be able to take them back to their office, whether it be this afternoon or tomorrow, and really put those things in place. Again, now is the, a great opportunity to do that. So again, uh, audience, thank you uh, for your participation and attendance and, you know, and attention to this uh, conversation. And certainly again, thank you all panelists for your discussion and, and uh, excellent contributions here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that brings us uh, very close to the close, uh, you know, as, uh, as Stephen mentioned, right, that brings us to the precipice uh, of this third virtual safer summit. Again, an excellent opportunity to hear from all sorts of thought leaders from, again, not just here in the United States, but again, uh, some of those as well as beyond our, uh, our borders here at the experiences that they've had, uh, again, with r remote work, workforce, workforce culture, uh, you know, employee health and safety, as well as organizational responses to that, whether that be a pandemic or crisis response. Again, keynote and panel sessions from today provided exactly that, right? Some real great discussions and really appreciate the speakers taking time out of their schedule to contribute that expertise and knowledge here today. Uh, one of the things I know is down here on the list, but we'll uh, make a plug and we'll make a plug again later. Certainly, if you've got any questions, certainly drop those either in the chat now. You'll receive an email that's got some instructions for feedback and opportunities to take a, a, a survey. Again, those will be some resources that will be shared with you. But certainly, again, Stephanie Roberts, uh, again, my co-conspirator and, and counterpart here that's helped with this excellent summit together. She'll be able to connect you with those resources from any of the panelists that we've heard from either yesterday or today. Again, thank you for registering for this event and participating in the discussions. 
Hope you were able to gain some valuable insights on the various topics that we covered and bring something back to your organization. Again, uh, take that as an opportunity to plug, uh, really filling out the survey that you will receive in an email, again, whether it be later this week or later uh, in this month. You know, those surveys are exactly what, and your feedback to those surveys specifically is what it really helps us structure whether that be safer activities or other activities at the National Safety Council and you know their thought leadership group, uh, it really helps structure the content that they provide back to individuals like you, whether they be members or non-members. It really helps us, you know, design and construct uh, the best quality content, get the best quality speakers that be able to present that information for you. So again, we certainly appreciate you taking the time out uh, of your schedule to to give back, to use that opportunity to be candid about the things that you appreciated. Uh, would like to have seen a little bit less of, would like to have seen a little bit more of. Those are the types of things that will also, you know, back to Nicole's comment about surveys, uh, right? It's your perception. If this is your opportunity to, to complete a perception survey about what did you perceive as being exceptional and uh, other things that you want to see. So we, you know, at the, on the National Safety Council side, we can adjust the, the dials and knobs to continue to further refine future offerings for you. I'd like to again thank the uh, CDC for funding. Uh, the work that the SAFER does, and for funding this sp very specific event. And as we close out today, I want to reflect on a couple of things that I heard. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, Dr. Van really uh, it was a point of inflection or it was, a, it was a transition point between the things that we focused on, people-centric, employee-centric, whether that be physical or mental health issues that we heard from yesterday. He talked a little bit about that in terms of the physical and psychological elements, but then transitioned, you know, in terms of, and was the, really the bridge to care and bridge to solutions for what we look at is an organizational response. The next pandemic and crisis management content that we heard from the, af the afternoon's panelists and this most recent panel, when we talk about the hybrid work environment, certainly employee centric, but also, you know, what are the responses, what are the, res the actions and activities that the organizations themselves can take to help facilitate that hybrid work environment. So those are the things that, you know, that I heard over the last two days, uh, again, and, and hopefully the audience really appreciates the content that was provided again, not only just yesterday, but also today. As a few other uh, reminders, the uh, script up there, as a reminder, we encourage you to take the exit survey, can't, you can't foot stop that enough. Uh, which can be found at the top of the page. Survey and recordings from both days will be provided in an email next week for your review. If you have any questions or do not receive the email, please reach out to Stephanie Roberts, again, at Stephanie, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E -E dot Roberts, R-O-B-E-R-T-S, at N-S-C dot org. Again, Stephanie dot Roberts at N-S-C dot org with any uh, questions that you have about the survey, the recordings, the email, feedback, anything that you have that you want to communicate to NSC staff, please feel free to, to contact Stephanie directly. I'd also like to rec remind you that the recent SAFER report that was published in September, which covers topics like worker health, vaccines, vaccine requirements, and more, you can access that report by going to nsc.org backslash SAFER, S-A-F-E-R, Again, nsc.org backslash safer and clicking on the reports tab. I also want to encourage you to sign up for National Safety Council's upcoming event, The Future of EHS, which will take place January 31st through February 2nd, 2023 in Long Beach, California. To register for this event, please go to nsc.org backslash future of EHS. F-U-T-U-R-E-O-F-E-H-S. Again, the future of VHS will be a thought leadership opportunity in January and February in Long Beach, California. Please don't hesitate to register today, nsc.org backsplash backspace uh, future of VHS. And with that, thank you. And again, for your active participation and engagement and have a wonderful rest of your week. Look forward to seeing you again at the next NSC and Safer Summit in 2023. Have a great day.